Indian or contemplated litigation to seek the advice of the city attorney and attorneys concerning legal issues pursuant to section 551.071 Texas Government Code and section 1.05 Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct for the following matters. Opio opioid settlement negotiated by the Texas Attorney General and reinvestment zone for TERS 4, possible purchase exchange lease or value of real estate pursuant to section 551.072 to deliberate the purchase of real property for public purpose, personal matters pursuant to section 551.074, convened into executive session pursuant to section 551.087, Texas Government Code to deliberate regarding the offer of economic incentives to one or more businesses, business prospects that the city seeks to have locate, stay, or expand in or near the city, Project Midnight Blue, Project Sendero. Thank you. We are now in executive session. Uh, there was no action taken during executive session. There will be no action taken now. Motion to adjourn. Second. All right. We are adjourned. And now we're going to call this regularly scheduled city council meeting to order. Uh, good evening, everyone. The time is 7.01 p.m. It is Tuesday, March the 7th. And I'm going to call this regularly scheduled city council meeting to order. Would all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would the city secretary please call the roll? Mitchell? Here. Tobias? Here. Heiser? Here. Flores Kale? Here. Zuniga? Present. Bradshaw? Here. Parsley? Here. All right, seven members present. We have a quorum. Next up, approval of the minutes. Mayor, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion to approve the minutes for City Council special meeting on February the 22nd, 21st, and also the regular council meeting the same day, February 21st, 2023. Second. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem, seconded by Councilmember Parsley that we approve the minutes. Is there discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Our motion carries seven to zero. Next up is citizen comments period. At this time, we ask anyone in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on any item to please do so. Uh, we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes and that you direct those comments to, mayor, to the mayor and council. We also ask that you fill out a citizen comments form and submit that to either myself or the city secretary. I have three folks who are registered now to speak. First up is Sarah Leos. Hello. Good evening. My first time and Luke's first time. Hey, Luke. Uh, we are commenting on the concern of the vibe that is going through Spring Branch and Silverado, uh, specifically behind our house. So our concern, my concern is the safety. It is going into a huge floodplain. Um, I'd hate to have, you know, rain wash away any persons <laughs> or children while they are on the vibe. <laughs> Also, behind our house, it's only about 25 feet from our fence line to the creek. So I know in the proposed vibe, it is set to have a base of 20 feet. So we're just wondering how that would set, especially since the elevations behind our house are about five feet difference in those 20 feet. So if it was to be cemented all the way up, we're worried about excessive flooding into our house and surrounding houses in our neighborhood. We are also concerned about the stagnant water that it may bring into our backyard, into neighboring backyards, and even on the other side into Plum Creek as well. And also just since it is a parks and rec uh, project, I would like to comment about um, it being a uh, cement. Uh, if it was a natural trail, I think it would be a little bit more viable, especially with the trees and the natural animals that are living behind our area into that natural uh, floodplain. And do you have anything, Luki? And I think that's it. Thank right. you. Thank you. <clears throat> 
All right, next up, Moses Leos. Okay, good evening, Mayor, Council. Uh, my name is Moses Leos, and I live at 268 Western Drive. And I am also speaking about the Vibe Trail and uh, some of the concerns that some of us have, some of us neighbors have in the Silverado subdivision and some of our uh, neighboring subdivisions too about the trail. And uh, my wife Sarah talked a lot, talked very, very eloquently about a lot of the, some of the concerns that uh, we have currently. And for me, one of the big things, one of the big things for safety is in the width of the path and what we're proposing to bring onto the path. Uh, from what I understand, it's going to be bicycles and pedestrian traffic, which is great. Uh, but then also the, the 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 want for golf carts and motorized scooters, and that to me does bring some concern because this is a 12 foot wide path. It's not particularly very wide. It's wide, but not as wide as something like the Velo Way in Austin, which I believe is 23 feet and they don't allow motorized vehicles on that path. It's bicycles and maybe e-scooters, maybe, maybe and motorized wheelchairs. So uh, my concern is that this could open the door for golf carts speeding through and we're speeding through this trail and behind our neighborhoods. And that is a big safety issue for, for me. That is a big safety issue. That's something we, we definitely don't really want. We want to have connect connectivity and I understand that. But that does bring some pause for me. Uh, and as Sarah mentioned as well, about the flooding issues as well, this particular trail being built in some areas along that is existing floodplain also does bring a lot of pause for me as well, just because, like Sarah said, we would it would be absolutely awful for someone, you know, maybe who, who goes around if, uh, the trail if it's barricaded, because we all know people sometimes go around cones, they go around barriers. We've seen that. People will do that. It'd be absolutely awful for someone to do that and then get hurt. We don't want that. So I, I wonder if this is something where we can all come together and find maybe alternatives for finding a better path for this particular project. I like the idea. It is, it is, it's, it's, it's nice. It's very fun. I like the idea of connectivity. I know that's something that we have talked about for a little while in the city, but I really do feel that we do need to shore up some of the, some of the safety issues in that regard. And, and then also, and also, also the, the privacy aspect too. And I got last 30 seconds here. Pr privacy aspect is also a big thing too. When I look at the Velo Way in some areas, there's a lot of buffer between the Velo Way, the, the pathway, and there's trees in between the pathway and the homes. And that for me is a big deal because this right now, the way it's setting on the proposed path, there's not really a buffer between my home and the trail, and I'm not really comfortable with people looking into my house. Same thing with our neighbors. We don't really want that. There's gotta be some way we can try to fix that in some way. So with that in mind, uh, thank you very much for hearing, hearing us out, and um, yeah, thank, look forward to talking with y'all hopefully soon. All right, thank you, Moses. Mm -hmm. All right, next up, Evangelina Chapa. Angelina Chapa, just for the record, thank you, Mayor, Council Members, for hearing me. Uh, I want to thank you all for the uh, 2023 Master Plan uh, open house that we had here at, the, uh, here at the City Hall. It was a good, com a good amount of people that came, and um, I want to thank you all for those people that walked around and notified some of the residents. Also, the yellow signs that were posted down on the roads. There was a letter that was that I received, and some did, some didn't. But thank you for at least trying to reach out to the residents. I know it's hard for the city to try to reach to the all the people around, but it was at least something a start, and I think that it needs to continue to making sure to let the the residents know of things that are happening in their area, especially around the downtown for those people that were living there. Uh, I know that the city uses the media a lot. A lot of people still don't have the media. And so uh, just just because the city uses it, don't think that everybody still has that. And I asked around people that were here and asked them, how did you find out? And word by mouth, either by the letter or, looking at the signs. Um, 
However, one particular that I did ask and that lives pretty close here in downtown, he said, actually, I, I found out by a friend that lives in another city that knew about the plan before me, before I even got the letter. So I think it's important to reach out to the residents that live here, that have lived, that uh, this is their property that we're making plans on, and I think that they need the respect for, for their, their property. So I appreciate what y'all have done so far. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that is all the citizen comment forms that I have in front of me. Is there anyone else who wishes to come forward and speak? All right, seeing none, I'm gonna close citizen comments. Citizen comments is now closed. Next up, uh, agenda item three, agenda order. Uh, is there anyone who has any items they wish to request to be moved? Uh, Council Member Florescale. Um, can we have agenda items 27 to 29 moved to consent? And then agenda item 26 moved up, uh, higher to consider and possible action. Uh, 26 and 27, which are, um, yes, yeah, so if we can move those to consent. Um, you know what, maybe 27, 28, 28 let's see. Yeah, 27, so 20, 27, 28, 29. You want to move the three items that are related to the forming of new committees to consent? Yeah, um, do, yeah usually we see resolutions in consent, but I don't know. I went back to try to figure out the like the rhyme and reason to it. Um, but if, if you guys don't want to, you don't have to, but the other one was going to be number 26 up a little bit further. Um, I was asked by a resident to move that up. Um, I, have a, I have the Prop F discussion uh, after the primary engineering contract items that we have, where we have uh, consultants and uh, attorneys in the room. So my goal was to move through those items while our paid staff is here first, and then to allow for the Prop F discussion, which I expect would be more potentially more robust to happen after. So my preference would be to leave that where it is. It is, it is the highest of the uh, council-focused items that we have. So I, I did want to put it as prominent, but okay, want to allow for us to get through those items first if possible. If we are worried about the paid staff, then that would be 27 to 29 then too. And we can move that up. Because that's also going to be staff. But salaried staff. I'm talking about the ones that are here for. Every, we, okay. we have a lot of staff who stays, but they're 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 staying as. as I just salary. didn't we know which to... one took precedence, so I'm yeah. sorry about that. Um, I Customer would like parsley. to move item 30, a little higher, maybe to consider impossible action. Okay. So you have folks here who want to present. Is that what um, it is? Yes. We have folks here in the staff. I don't, I don't have any issues with that, with moving that one higher. Um, any other thoughts? Okay. All right, now next up is agenda item number four, International Women's Day Proclamation. Councilor Parsley. All right, so um, this is my first proclamation, so bear with me in my pronunciation. <laughs> so, um, the city of Kyle does a proclamation uh, for International Women's Day, whereas International Women's Day is celebrated globally on March the 8th by those who seek to improve the lives of all women through cultural, legal, economic, and social change, and whereas International Women's Day celebrates the collective power of women, pays tribute to their achievements, and recognizes the remaining challenges to further efforts for women's rights, encouraging and mobilizing all, the pe all people to contribute for positive change. And whereas the city of Kyle honors the accomplished and visionary women who have helped build our country, including those whose contributions have not been adequately recognized and celebrated. And whereas the city of Kyle pays tribute to the trailblazers from the recent and distant past for daring to envision a future for which no past president existed and for building a nation of endless possibilities for all its, all its women. Whereas the currently there are women serving locally in leadership positions, inspiring the continued work in advancing the rights, opportunities, and full participation of women and girls of all backgrounds. And whereas on the 112th International Women's Day, we celebrate and encourage everyone to support the 2023 theme of Embrace Equity. And whereas while International Women's Day activity escalates from March the 8th, Prime employers for women maintain a deep and continuous focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion all year round. 
Therefore, to be it proclaimed by the city of Kyle that March the 8th, 2023 should be celebrated as International Women's Day in appreciation of the many achievements of women of Kyle and those across this nation and the world. That's it. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you very much. Does anybody have any comments on that they want to add? All right. I did wanted to mention that this is so fitting in here because I love to have three females in this council and the mayor, so uh, we're almost halfway. <laughs> Please say something. Mayor yes. Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, council member, uh, partially for bringing this forward. Yes, it is important that we do recognize the... Uh, the women in our community for all the work that they do, um, especially uh, my, my three colleagues that are up here that are serving on council and for the many out there. Um, we do appreciate all the hard work that you do and, and, and it, is, uh, it is fitting that we recognize all your accomplishments as well. So I just wanted to uh, address that to, to all the ladies out there, all the women out there that we uh, I myself uh, appreciate all the hard work that you do, what you bring to your community, what you bring to your families as well. And so uh, I thank you, Mr. Councilmember Parsley, for bringing this forward for recognition. Thank you. There we go. Anyone else? All right. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. You want to do a photo? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> All right, next up is agenda item number five, uh, proclamation acknowledging Jerry White, uh, Jared White, for his work as an Eagle Scout to benefit the Kyle Housing Authority. Mayor Council, Mayor Council for the record, Jerry Hendricks, interim city manager. It's, uh, a couple months ago, I was uh, made aware that an Eagle Scout was doing a project for the Kyle Housing Authority. Two things that are very dear to my heart, the Housing Authority and Eagle Scouts. At this point, I'd like to ask Jared White to come up while I read his proclamation. Pretend this is the mayor reading this because it's got him at the bottom of it. <laughs> it says, whereas the city of Kyle takes pride in its sense of community and citizen involvement, and whereas the vision of the Boy Scouts of America is to prepare every eligible youth in America to become responsible, participating citizens and leaders who are guided by the Scout Oath and Law. And whereas Jared White is a Kyle resident and a student at Live Oak Academy High School, and whereas Jared has been working toward the rank of Eagle for five years, and this project is a perfect example of Jared's commitment to scouting and to his community. And whereas as part of his project, Gerald has installed Jared has installed a blessing box in the Pete Dressing community, which is part of the Kyle Housing Authority. And whereas a blessing box provides a source of food that benefits the residents at the Pete Dressing community, and whereas Jared's project is a perfect example of how one individual can organize a community to come forward and develop a project to benefit others, and whereas Jared has grown into a well-respected young man 
that both scouts and adults look to as an example for all in the city of Kyle and Hayes County. Therefore, be it proclaimed that I, Travis Mitchell, Mitchell by the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Kyle, <laughs> do hereby honor Jared White of Boy Scout Troop 128 and recognize the honor of this journey to the rank of Eagle Scout and his example of community service for all. Jared, congratulations. I want to say as an Eagle Scout, father of an Eagle Scout and a scout leader that's done many Eagle Scouts, very proud to be able to present this to you and congratulations on the hard work. I, we had to have Jerry uh, read that because uh, of what he just said, being the Eagle Scout and of that lineage. But Jared, tell us just briefly uh, something that was meaningful to you as a result of going through this project, specifically with the Housing Authority. Um, well, <laughs> I when I was thinking about the idea I, of what I wanted to do as my Eagle Scout project, um, my parents and I thought of many different ideas, but I didn't really feel like they helped out the community and I really wanted to make something notable so that people really felt like they were being helped and I felt like this was a perfect um, perfect project for uh, just being able to help out people in need of food at any time of day and thank you it's very good I, I, I told Jared that I was gonna embarrass him when I saw you the other day. So uh, hopefully that's mission accomplished. Councilman Heiser, don't go anywhere. Hey, Jared, I don't know if you're aware, but we're uh, Ki of Kayak, our uh, student advisory program here in the area. So just putting it on your radar. If it's, this is something you'd like to continue uh, the pursuit of, we'd love to have you apply uh, to be on uh, the Kayak Council. Thank you, I'll keep it in mind. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to say thank you for, for that contribution and to know that you had so many different ideas and how you came up with this on your, on your own to, uh, in a pretty unique way as far as the food goes. It shows compassion in your heart for your community and the people. And just know that that box that you have there probably there could have been a family member or person that may needed some food that day and may not be able to have it and you provided for that. So um, I just wanted to say thank you and for also contributing back to your community as well. It's, it's, it's so awesome to see all those uh, patches that you earned on there you know, uh, and it's well deserved. And so I just want to wish you the best of luck with your, with your endeavor with getting your Eagle Scout. Thank you. So thank you. Floor Scout. Thank you. Um, I just I want to say thank you um, for being an inspiration to to me um, and hopefully to people that you go to school with at Live Oak. Um, to the community overall, there's a lot of things that you could have done. Uh, I'm, I have no doubt that you've made your parents proud. Um, I will admit my husband is a boy, a boy Scout, not an Eagle Scout by any means, but I will tell you um, I firmly believe you are going to make a really great husband one day because <laughs> as much as I give my husband a hard time about his, his uh, Boy Scout skills, I have no doubt if I'm ever lost in a forest or we have gun hiking that he is going to find our way out. And so um, you're, you're a really great, great person. And so thank you for your contribution to society. Now I'm going to embarrass you. Because <laughs> I asked him about if he had a girlfriend when we, I went and saw him playing golf the other day. He said he ain't got time for that because he's busy. <laughs> Councilor Zuniga. But you're right. But wait, can I say my husband said, he said the same thing about me until he <laughs> met me and then he made time. <laughs> Which is the right answer, by the way. <laughs> Councilor Zuniga. Yes, uh, Jared, I just want to echo what everyone else has already said to you and applaud uh, your, your hands on hard work, your determination. Um, to uplift others and um, just that uh, you set a good example of being a make it happen kind of guy and uh, remind me of um, you know of, 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 of other kids that um, set big goals and get them achieved so thank you of course all right uh, if you want to come forward I think we also have some members of the housing authority uh, board uh, as well as directors here if you all want to come forward we'll take a, a photograph with Jared if you'd like
after. Oh, just there. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not going to come up there. Short <laughs> All right. I think we can see on the count of three. <laughs> there we go. One, two, three. And right here. One, two, three. Wait, I got to get one, two, three. <laughs> there we go. Thanks, Rev. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next up is city manager's report. Mayor, Mayor, Tim Council, once again, Jerry Hendricks, interim city manager. For the record, first up for the city manager's report is Mariana Espinoza with our parks department. Mayor and Council, Mariana Espinoza, Parks and Recreation Director. Just a reminder that on May 4th through May 7th, the city of Cairo will be hosting the Wall That Heals, the Vietnam Memorial Wall That Heals. And right now we are currently looking for volunteers uh, for 24 hours a day during that time. You can go online to sign up to register. And also uh, everyone in the community has the opportunity to honor their veterans through the program called the In Memory Program. You go online, click on the In Memory link and you can honor your veteran, add their photo and their name and it'll be on display uh, during the time uh, May 4th through 7th when the Wall That Heals is here. And then also for tomorrow, International Women's Day, the uh, Parks Department will be hosting music, wine, and good company out at Mary Call Hartson Park. It is free to attend, open to the public between 5 and 8. And then on Saturday, March 18th, the Sunday, March 19th, we have a family camp out at Lake Kyle Park. Registration is $20 family, and you can register online. It's out by the blue bonnets, and the blue bonnets are growing nicely already. And then save the date for April 1st for the annual Easter extravaganza from 10 to 1.30 at Greg Clark Park. It's free and open to the public. And Mayor and Council, your scenic city signs are now installed at all your gateways, uh, one downtown, one at Lake Kyle, and there'll be one going at Heroes Memorial Park. That's all I have. All right, next up is Colleen Tierney with our public library. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Colleen Tierney, Director of Library Services for the record. Just to go over some of the programs we have coming up uh, this in the next couple weeks, we have a couple events for spring break, a teen reptile show um, that requires re pre-registration. We have Irish step dancing show um, in honor of St. Patrick's Day on March 16th. And also this week we have a senior movie, a uh, league of their own in honor of uh, International Women's Day. And also uh, pictured here, I have we have um, some programs going on in honor of Women's History Month. Um, we have social media posts honoring um, historic and current uh, fabulous women this month. We also have some story times that are featuring um, girl empowerment kind of stories. And also um, this picture depicts an amazing display that uh, Shannon Boxel has done for the library. It's it was a little hard to imagine what she had in mind when she proposed it, but I don't know if you can tell from the picture, but she kind of made paper dolls out of all of those women and um, has a little card depicting what they did in history and then has a book that goes along with each one of them. It, it looks really awesome. It, the picture doesn't quite give it justice, but she is quite artistic and is um, bringing a lot to our library right now with all her talent. Um, one thing that she has also uh, kicked up or kicking off is our uh, seed library, uh, which is, I may have alluded to it in the past, it is a, a little bit like a little free library for seeds. Uh, and what that is, is uh, it, it's, we're actually going to be unveiling it in April on Earth Day. 
But um, before then, we are going to have a seed swap on March 25th, which um, basically is a day where we're going to have some of the Hayes County Master Gardeners there doing some educational um, gardening classes and some activities and refreshments and really just getting people um, thinking about gardening and things that are sustainable in this climate and um, learning ways to um, be part of our seed library. So this is kind of the pre-event for our um, unveiling of our seed library. And that's all I have. Thank you, Colleen. Next up is Rachel Sonier, our Director of Communications. Hello, Council. Uh, so I'll be talking about the pirate treasure hunt. It's currently happening and will be going on through the 22nd. We've already had a couple of the treasure chests found, so uh, don't miss out on your chance to win $314. Uh, we have four chests hidden around the city all throughout parks. We will be releasing clues. We've already released our first clue on our uh, social channels. So uh, if you have any questions or want to know how it works, just go to cityofkyle.com slash pie hunt or email communications department at cityofkyle.com. Video. Oh. Don't think we got it queued up. Hold on. Grant, would you be able to play the pirate <laughs> video for council? <laughs> He might not be able to have it loaded up right now. Let me check my phone. We'll forward it to you. The video that, that the communications team put together is is outstanding and is award-worthy in many areas, and I can't wait for you to see it. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Jerry. Next Research up, shows nostalgia can help you remember ads. So customize and save with Liberty Mutual. I, I, I knew that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Ahoy there, city of Kyle. It be your lucky day, because from here on out, you're a part of the great pirate Captain Kylie's crew. Ha <laughs> ha! No, being on my crew won't be very easy, for there is a treasure to be found in this here city. Last year, Pirate Park hid treasure here in the city of Kyle, and legend has it this mystical treasure shall appear again. This is where ye come in. We only have a short window to find the treasure. It'll only be visible from March 1st to March 22nd. If you find one of the four chests hidden throughout the city of Kyle, in the parks and in the trails, follow the instructions inside to notify me that you found a piece of the treasure. For each chest you find, you'll be entered into a raffle for a chance to win Pirate Park's fortune of $314. Good luck, me crew, and happy hunting. Does, does that person work for us? That was hired talent. Ah, oh, okay. I was like, man, they got a good accent. <laughs> but the staging, lighting, production, oh, yeah. all the production oh, design was comms team. Yeah, that was just awesome. Speaking of awesome, William Atkinson, director of planning, up next. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Smooth. Um, so we have a couple updates. We have a comprehensive master plan update. Um, right now we have uh, approximately 231 online map responses uh, for our online portion of the, of the interactive map tool for the comprehensive plan, and that's going to be live until Tuesday, March the 21st. It'll be the last item that we're going to have in terms of data collection on that side of things. And then on the downtown master plan open house, uh, we hosted that here in the council chambers on Thursday, February 23rd. We, over a three hour course of time, we had approximately 100 to 150 residents that attended in person, which is, we had a lot of great conversations, we had a lot, a lot of great feedback, and uh, we're still processing the data that we got in person. But uh, we had approximately 233 online responses also registered specifically for the downtown master plan. So we're pretty excited about all that kind of stuff going on, so, yeah. I have a question. Um, is it possible, I know we said that was the last one, but the turnout was really good and I think uh, more people wanted to come. Uh, and this, this last one was a little bit um, unorganized, I guess, and so I didn't know if we were going to be able to give the residents an opportunity to come out, maybe give them something a little bit more um, organized. 
as possible. Sure. So we hadn't intended on doing that. Um, we we do understand that uh, as people were walking in that there was a little bit of confusion about how they walk around about throughout the, the process we were doing. So we did explain that to them. Um, uh, there was some questions about the, uh, the, there were some assumptions that there was gonna be a presentation. Um, we didn't have a presentation and we weren't intending to do so. But uh, we did have a couple of draft maps or, or master plans out on the table as well. So we had a lot of options for garnering feedback it was a it was a slam dunk in terms of gathering a lot a lot of feedback right at the very end there and we're going to add that to what was already gathered okay i just know that there was other people that wanted to go that didn't get a chance as well so no i hear that Thank we you. this online response is, is a digital format so if we can if they want to be on there uh it's uh it's online so but there's still that option until a couple of weeks from now Thank you. yes ma'am Mayor Council, that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, CIP road projects and consent agenda presentation. Mr. Barba. Good evening, Mayor Council. Leon Barba, city engineer. We'll start off with La Verde Park. Uh, we're about 84% complete. Uh, but most of this information I presented to you at the last meeting, so it's pretty much the same thing. I did want to make a highlight of the, some of the stuff that has been completed. They did complete the uh, decomposed granite in the dog park, and uh, the trees would have all been installed, but one of the trees apparently got damaged when, it was all, uh, when they were unloading it, so uh, there's one tree left to plant out there. And their completion date is April of 2023. Can I make a quick um, question about La Verde? Um, so I went and visited this weekend, and I did see improvement. Um, I did see children playing, which was very scary. So, yes. Um, in the park? Inside the park, okay. yes. <laughs> well, let so, the contractor know. Yes. I don't want to be liable for any incidents with, like, beams sticking out and some sort of accidents. I will pass that on. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Public Safety Center, we're about 83% complete. Uh, they're continuing to paint on the level one and two. The, still installing the overhead lights on level one and two. They are placing some concrete on for seat walls and uh, some on the level two for the roof stairs. Uh, they're working in the training room again, in there, but this time they're painting and installing the ceiling grid. Uh, substantial completion date of that is May 2023. Wastewater treatment expansion project, uh, we're about 99% complete. Uh, the still, they're still doing some training on the dewatering facility. They did start up the bullseye plant number one, so both the bullseyes are working uh, as we wanted them to. Uh, we're still working the final punch list. Uh, just to let council know, there is a public meeting on uh, the wastewater treatment plant permit amendment uh, at 7 p.m. on March 30th at uh, Kyle Public Library. Uh, we did post notices on the Free Press and uh, City of Kyle's webpage. Can I ask a question about yes, sir. the uh, Public Safety Center? Yes, sir. Um, is there any plans to put more, put some trees out there, um, maybe on around the Safety Center? So when I went out and looked at it, it it's a driveway um, parking lot, but is there going to be any any green infrastructure put in, like? at all also um wouldn't that have been a good opportunity to reuse rooftop water somehow to like flush your toilets with with runoff water so i'm just kind of curious why a lot of the um um re, re resources weren't weren't used on, on the building that we had an opportunity as a city to kind of um, make it a little a greener, a little greener. Were those at all considered in the original building? 
Council Member, I was not involved with the original design of the uh, facility. I, I would have to get back to you for, with uh, staff from uh, the, the crew, the development crew, and see what, what the plans were at that time. Uh, so that's the only thing I can tell you at this point in time. They should have a landscaping plan, and I will check on that so also. There will, there they should have. There should be a landscaping plan. But obviously they're still doing construction, so they don't want to have it, right. have it torn I, up and all that kind of stuff. So Yeah, I figured, is it a timing thing, but we, we will see it later? Typically it comes near the end when they're trying to wrap up the project. That's correct. Okay. But I'll get you some updates at the next council meeting on uh, the landscaping and uh, what the, um, what options they looked at as far as doing using some, using some restocking or some what we call lead type uh, improvements in that facility. But I'll, I'll get you the information on that that I can find. Okay. okay. South Side Wastewater Project. We're about 91 percent complete. Uh, they have inspected all of our the lines that were installed, and uh, we're reviewing those as a uh, the Public Works Department is reviewing those uh, videos to make sure that everything's clean and clear. Uh, we should be wrapping it up uh, this month. Elliott Branch Interceptor. Uh, probably the last time you'll see this slide on the Elliott Branch, uh, LA Branch project. We're pretty well completed with this project. Uh, we're still working on the punch list. And uh, just to let you know, we did install quite a bit of new infrastructure in that project. But this project is uh, substantially complete now. That's Downtown relocation of overhead lines. We're still struggling with uh, the uh, fiber optic companies trying to get uh, the work done out there. Spectrum is, uh, has been placing the fiber. Now they have to do the splicing, which is going to take four to five weeks. So that's another probably two months before we'll see that project wrapped up. Uh, once that splicing is done, then PEC will be out there removing the, the poles. So hopefully in two months we'll see some more activity and, and some completion of some of that project. Old Post Road, the county has been pulled off on the uh, debris removal, so as soon as they get a chance to get back quickly and uh, those ditches dry up, they're going to come back and wrap that drainage work up. They've got a little bit more level up to do with paving, and then that's pretty much going to wrap up their portion of the project. Councilmember. Is that going to be as wide as that road can go? It's, 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 there's a, that road is going to have a 22-foot wide roadway that you ride on, two 11-foot lanes, and it's going to have two 4-foot shoulders. So it's, it's the, what you see down there is a pretty wide section, but it will be narrowed down to about 22 foot of travel lanes, uh, two 11 foot lanes, and then you're gonna have four foot shoulders on both sides, which we didn't have shoulders before. So we'll have shoulders there this time. Okay, but that, all that's included in what's already there. Like there's no way it can go any wider, is that correct? That's, there's no plan to widen the road at this time. Okay, thank you. Indian Paintbrush List Station, we're about 51% complete, uh, installing air vents. They've uh, poured some concrete for the order control slab, uh, working on mechanical piping, installation of some crane foundations and pipe supports, and they're planning to continue on that uh, over the next couple of weeks. Some of you may have seen this vehicle out on the, through the city, but they have completed their uh, field data collection. This is a pavement management assessment uh, the council approved recently. So they have uh, gotten their data, they've collected it, and now they're going to start putting that information together. So I've also given you their schedule on how they plan to complete their reports and when they plan to have it completed. But uh, hopefully we'll see a final report on the pavement data uh, middle of June, and then uh, on June 30th we'll see the rest of the assets that we asked them to collect, for example, street lights, sidewalks, and signs. We have two consent agenda items that I wanted to bring to your attention. One is number nine. This is a, an amendment to task order number four to CPNY to continue their design of uh, what we're calling phase one and phase two of the uh, uh, interceptors that we need to upsize that lead to the plant. This is the last section that's right there before the plant's about 10,000 feet. 30-inch line, uh, it, it, uh, it's in pretty bad condition, lots of infiltration inflow into that particular line, so with the plan right now is to upsize that line to about a 48-inch line, so uh, we're going to take this project up to 60% and then uh, find additional funding to complete the project. On the consent agenda item number 10, uh, we set up kind of a rotation list for acquisition services, and these firms went through the uh, uh, RFQ process and our recommendation is to select LJ Engineering and Stateside right away to provide those services as we need them. Questions? Mayor Pratt. Okay, uh, thank you for the update. Um, this is on a, on a different note. Uh, when it came to Roland Lane, the construction that was going out there, 
I know uh, there was some signage that was placed kind of incorrect where vehicles were not able to leave westbound. Uh, but I do want to thank um, Harper Wilder and, and Philip uh, Pressler, Mr. Hendricks, and everybody who uh, got on top of that because we actually had an 18-wheeler that was blocked that couldn't exit out. And as the resident was in, on the phone with me, um, that 18 wheeler couldn't get out of that. It was trying to exit out, and we had school buses coming, and we had traffic. So, uh, but our city staff uh, was on it. They they took care of the problem within within minutes. So I want to give a big uh, thank you to that. So in referencing that that subdivision that's coming in off of near Ayers Lane, they're widening the road on Roland. Correct? Do we know how far up they're going to go? Are they going to go all the way to Stagecoach, or is it just up to that subdivision line? Just up to their subdivision line. And they'll transition, but that's as far as they're going to go. Okay. Is the county looking at expanding Roland Lane all the way up that we know of, or any plans so that way it could be uniformed all the way through, all the way up to Stagecoach? I'm not aware of any current plans. It's, it probably is on their transportation master plan, but I, I don't think I've heard of any plans for them to do anything in the near future on that road. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other questions for Leon? Councilor Parsley. Thank you. I do have a question about item number nine, and, and hopefully you can explain to me. So I do love the timeline that is displayed, and I'm looking forward to that design phase that they have in there, um, but can you kind of, give me an idea of what those numbers are. Like how much did we have initially planned for that task, um, task order four? The uh, consent agenda item number nine? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we had this year budgeted $400,000 for that, uh, that project. Okay. And obviously we couldn't take it to 100%, so the decision was made we'd take it as far as we could with the, the budget that we had for that, that particular project. So that's what you're seeing here is that we took it up to 60%. So we didn't want to stop them and just have them stop cold and try to start uh, in, uh, in October. So the decision was made, let's go ahead and, and we have the money now, let's go ahead and get them started and get as much work as we can get done so we can continue getting that line upsized. Okay. That so particular line is, is in bad shape, uh, council member. It does need to be uh, upgraded and replaced. Okay, and so we are just designing the line and that's what the 391 is gonna cover, right? Thousand. The, that 391 covered the preliminary engineering and also the, uh, I'm sorry, it is, that's only for taking it up to 60%. We did the preliminary engineering report, which is attached in the backup, uh -huh. and that uh, gave us the, the direction that we needed on what we wanted to do there. And so this 60% will take us up to uh, roughly, we'll, we'll have some of the work done, but not all the work done. So we'll have to come back to council to get, uh, get that work Another completed amendment. up to 100%. Okay, thank you. And then can we ask about... 11, 12, and 13 right mm -hmm. now? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so just so I make sure that I'm understanding um, consent agenda 11, 12, and 13, um, they're giving the city 35% of the total construction price as basically an insurance for those improvements that they did? That's the maintenance bond that we require. Yes. We require 35% for two years. Okay. And that's to ensure that if there's any defects in the materials, or that uh, they will come back and fix it. That's okay, correct. that's within two years. That's within. That's a two-year contract. Typically, most cities will require 10% for about a year, but here in Cobb, we require 35% for two years. They give me the. They get, They have the construction price on what it took them to build that. They take 35% of that, and that's what they post as a maintenance bond. Okay, thank you. No more questions for me. Customer floor scale. Yeah, I just have a question for Perez. Can you tell me how much is left in the wastewater impact fee fund, please? Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members, I'm Pervez Mohi, City's Director of Finance. Not off the top of my head, I'll have to look it up and send you that information, but it's gonna be close to about six, seven million dollars. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right, thank you. Uh, does anybody have any items they wish to pull from the consent agenda? Motions? <clears throat> Twenty-seven, twenty-eight, and twenty-nine. Twenty-seven. Well, yeah, we're allowed to. Yeah. 
Did she move it? No. Oh, okay. Second. All right. Motion by Councilmember uh, Bradshaw, seconded by Councilmember Parsley, that we've approved the entire consent agenda. Is there discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. All right. Motion carries seven to zero. Next up is a public hearing, uh, agenda item number 15, uh, concerning the creation of reinvestment zone number four, pursuant to the provisions of Chapter 311 of the Texas uh, Tax Code. Uh, uh, this item has been left open for a few meetings. We do have the attached agreements to come forward. Is there anyone who wishes to come forward and speak? Yes. Uh, good evening, uh, City uh, and Mayor. Uh, for the record, my name is Jack Peterson. I work for FM 158 Land, commonly known as the Coleman Property. I've emailed a, uh, a copy of my presentation. I hope that you guys have received that. Um, I'm here to discuss items 15 through 17 and how their uh, project's water diversion impacts our property. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to skip to page number five. Uh, in the fully developed condition for Limestone Creek, in the 100-year storm event, roughly 557 CFS will be diverted south to FM 158 Lands property. This is a lot of water, roughly 250,000 gallons per minute. The plan that is being presented tonight in the development agreement approves the illegal diversion of stormwater through Goforth Road. Per Exhibit C of the development agreement, the stormwater pipe under Goforth Road will illegally hook up to our channel located in San Marcos's ETJ. This is outside of the City of Kyle's jurisdiction. Texas Water Code, Chapter 11, Section 86, states that no person may divert or impound the natural flow of surface water in this state. Um, as it stands, FM 158 land is already obligated to provide stormwater for the Alliance project. Between Alliance and FM 158 land, they have contributed $10 million to the construction of that stormwater channel. This was done so without ever knowing that Limestone Creek had plans to use that land for their own benefit. Our current pond footprint on FM 158 land sits at 19.178 uh, acres. This pond footprint is adequate to, uh, adequately sized to store Alliance's stormwater. Now, if you approve this plan tonight, the pond footprint with Limestone Creek will sit at 65.1 acres. FM 158 land's footprint will need to triple in size in order to take on Limestone Creek's drainage. This is not economically feasible, and no one has secured an easement from us to do this. So what can be done? According to their engineer, Limestone Creek and Waterstone have come up with a possible solution that sends the stormwater to the east along Waterstone's southern boundary. This is probably the best plan for everybody involved and does not include our involvement. Uh, we have a meeting that is scheduled for Friday to further discuss that. Um, the development agreement that is being voted on tonight for Limestone Creek needs to be updated to exclude the illegal diversion of, of stormwater through Goforth Road that violates the Texas wa uh, Water Code, Chapter 11, Section 86, and in order to avoid future litigation, the development agreement will need to be modified to include their new plan, which sends that water along Waterstone's southern boundary and into Clear Fork Creek, where that water has historically gone. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who wishes to come forward and speak? All right, seeing none, I'm gonna close the public hearing. The public hearing is now closed. Uh, next up is agenda items 16 and 17, uh, as well as 18. All three of the the items, 16 through 18, Stephanie. So one is the first reading of the uh, uh, consideration and approval of an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Kyle, Texas, designating a contiguous geographic area within the corporate limits of the city as a reinvestment zone pursuant to Chapter 311 of the Texas Tax Code also known as reinvestment zone number four. And then agenda item 17 is considering possible action of the second amendment to the amended and restated Limestone Creek Development Agreement 
and then consider uh, uh, agenda item number 18 is consideration and approval of a resolution of the city of Cal Texas accepting a petition to increase the estimated cost of the improvements for improvement area number two. Um, so is that a separate I, one? That's a separate. Okay, pin. so we'll just go 16 and 17. That's why I was asking. I looked down too late. To, all right, we're doing 16 and 17 together, okay. Ms. Lively. Okay, so uh, for action 16, uh, creation of the tours, public notice that was just held uh, provided public notice for cre creation of a tax increment and reinvestment zone over both what we call a residential and commercial portion of uh, this tourist. So it will encompass, encompass what is Limestone Creek, the residential uh, component, and then also a contemplated commercial component. City consultants, city staff, are bringing forward a resolution tonight that will create a tourist only over the residential component of that project. So the ordinance that you have before you is a tourist creation for a reduced boundary over what is the Meritage property of Limestone Creek. So we have the, the boundaries associated with, for the tourist that will be created. We also have a project and financing plan for that residential component. Uh, tax increment revenues from the residential component will be used both to buy down pit assessments when pit bonds are issued and then also pay for some additional public improvement costs associated with the residential development that may not be pit eligible. All of that information is provided in the project finance plan. I'm here as a resource for council. We also have Mark McClaney with SAMCO, the uh, city's financial advisor. And then we have John with P3, who is the both PIT and TERS administrator for this project. They've crafted the project and financing plan with input from the working group. So happy to answer any and all questions that you all have about this development. All right, does anybody have any questions? Councilmember Florescale. <clears throat> oh, I'm not for you, but I want to go back to agenda item 15 for the public hearing. Um, it looks like we got an email, and I just have a question. Um, why the representative of the landowner was not able to display his presentation? That's, that's for Jennifer. It's probably for Paige, if you'd rather have Paige answer it. Um, yeah, is that, I guess if, if we're going to be giving that out, it, it would be better if it came from legal and not from Jennifer. But yes, I would like to know why. Uh, it was requested whether that was the rules of council addressed this question. The rules of council do not address presentations by the public other than time limitations. And so uh, because those were not addressed as far as displaying something, then that was it was not included in the council online presentation. So uh, what we're saying collectively as council is when there's a hearing, there's no presentation. From, this, from the public hearing, the people that participate in the public hearing, from the, the uh, members of the public that comment. There's nothing in the rules that address members of the public being able to use and present in the, um, I'm sorry, I'm having. No, you're good. You're <laughs> good. I'm just trying to understand. Okay, yeah, so the, the I guess council, my question would be ultimately. Rules, the council rules do not address members of the public providing uh, electronic data to produce and provide for the council to see up on the uh, the screens, and so so it was not allowed. So, is there a reason why council wasn't asked? I'm, I'm ready to talk whenever you want, but I mean, you can keep talking. It was it was my decision, so it was my it was my call that I, that I made, and the basis on uh, for that call is because uh, citizen comments and public hearings have been treated the same under rules of council for seven years. In citizen comments, we do not allow presenters to bring forward and use our materials to have three minutes in the podium to speak. So in all public hearings, TERS, PIDs, anything that I've ever used, I've never allowed for that presentation. But what we did do is request the presenter who wanted to do that to please email so we would all have it to, in order to be consistent. Okay. And that's the answer. I, I'm just asking. And, and really, it's not just for us, too. It's also for the residents. Hmm. And so that, that's why I asked. Because I think, okay. to be fair, it would and to be transparent, it would be shown, but I didn't realize there was a limitation on that or lack of definition of a, a limitation. Um, okay, that's the only question I had for, our, for for number 15. As far as the 16 and 17, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not comfortable moving forward. I feel like um, 
overall, I really liked this um, idea of having a TERS. I think there was a process um, regarding possible eminent domain that was supposed to be um, kind of a little more thoughtful, and it hasn't been. Um, and so for that reason, um, I, I find it really hard to move forward uh, approving either one of these um, until we get in front of the, the other issue first. Additional comments? Councilmember Parsley. Mayor, I would like to make a motion to approve items 16 and 17. Can I, sorry, can I interrupt for just one second, just so there's clarification? It's on the agenda for first reading. The ordinance will be effective immediately upon adoption by council. It's not subject to a second reading requirement. Uh, tax code has a provision that an ordinance creating the terrace is effective immediately upon passage. Okay, motion by Councilmember Parsley, second by Bra uh, Councilmember Bradshaw. We approve agenda item 16 and 17. Is there a discussion on the motion? Councilmember Zuniga. Uh, I wanted to make a motion to include the commercial into the TERS 4. So you could uh, make a motion to amend? To amend. All right, so the motion is made by Councilmember Zuniga to amend the items to include the commercial uh, piece. Uh, is there a second? Second. Uh, seconded by Councilmember Flores Kale. Is there a discussion on that motion? All right, we'll take a roll, roll call vote. Uh, the motion is to amend to include the commercial component. Tobias? Aye. Parsley? Nay. Flores Kale? Yes. Bradshaw? Nay. Zuniga? Yes. Mitchell? Yes. Heiser? No. All right, motion carries four to three. All right, uh, so now the motion that's on the table is to approve agenda items 16 and 17 and include the commercial component. Is there a discussion on that motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. All right, motion carries five to two. All right, next up is agenda item number 18, consideration and approval of a resolution of the City of Kyle, Texas, accepting a petition to increase the estimated costs of the improvements for improvement area number two of the Southwest Kyle Public Improvement District number one and calling for a public hearing pursuant to Chapter 372 of the Texas Local Government Code. Ms. Lightning. So the city has received a petition for increased costs associated with Southwest Kyle PID. Um, procedurally, to increase costs after a pit is created, the city would have to walk through the steps that it does in the actual creation of the pit. This pit was originally created by the city and has issued bonds for improvement area number one. In connection with development of improvement area number two, the developer is coming forward for, with a request for some additional costs to be covered, and so that's what this petition addresses. If council adopts the resolution tonight, we will call a public hearing and have a public hearing on what is in essence those increased costs. So this resolution or accepting this petition, calling the public hearing would task city consultants with um, analyzing the petition, working with the developer to understand um, what those additional costs would be, what authorized improvements would be constructed. We'd have a public hearing on that and then adopt a resolution if the city decided to move forward. We do have representatives from the developer and their council here tonight to answer any specific questions that council may have in relation to that proposal. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Leiby. Does anybody have any questions for the presenter? <coughs> Motions? I would like to make a motion to approve item 18. Second. All right, motion by Councilmember Parsley, seconded by Councilmember Tobias, that we approve, or Mayor Pro Tem Tobias, that we approve agenda item number 18. Is there discussion on that motion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you. Um, all right, next up is agenda item number 19. And just as an FYI on, on 30, we're gonna take it up after this next set of items. Um, the agenda items are 19, 20, 21, 22 and 23, they are all related to engineering of our road bonds. So agenda item 19 is approved task order number two to BGE, uh, Houston, Texas, an amount not to exceed $947,810 for engineering services and design of Button Creek Road from Lehman Road to Porter Cove. 
Agenda item 20, approved task order number two to American Structure Point, Inc., Dallas, Texas, in the amount not to exceed $436,194.96 for engineering services and design of BB from North I-35 Frontage Road to Dacey. Agenda item 21, approved task order number three to American Structure Point, Inc., Dallas, Texas, in the amount not to exceed $788,221.88 for engineering services and design of BB Road from Dacey Lane to east of Green Pastures Road. Uh, agenda item 22, approved task order number 16 to LJA uh, Engineering, Inc., Austin, Texas, in the amount not to exceed $1,101,207.34 for engineering services and design of Kohler's Crossing from I-35 North Brown Frontage Road to Seton Parkway. And agenda item 23, approved task order number 17 to LJA Engineering, Inc., Austin, Texas, in an amount not to exceed $2,158,287.27 for engineering services and design of Kohler's Crossing from I-35 southbound to the I-35 northbound frontage road. Mr. Cantalupo. Good evening, Mayor. Council, I'm uh, Joe Cantalupo. I work for Key Freeze and Associates, and I am the program manager uh, for your general engineer consulting team for the bond. Uh, these are uh, the first three projects, uh, first five sections of roadway under the bond program. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions or, or just give you a couple of comments about the projects if you like. Sure. So the first thing to note uh, is for the, the items number uh, 19, or item number 19, that's for um, Button Creek Road. And that is to get the schematic design done. And as a reminder, the schematic design is also known as a 30% plan. And that is so, um, as much as we've estimated, the design engineers have estimated during the PER process, this is where we get into the detail of the projects and uh, firm up the right of way and make sure that the path we're on in terms of the, the, what the road will look like and how it will function is the right path. Um, so that's the first project. It is for schematic design. The second two projects, uh, items 20 and 21, are for American Structure Point. And this is for BB Road. A and you'll note that we're proposing that BB Road be broken into two pieces. So if you're at the I-35 frontage road, the first piece, what we call the western piece loosely, is we'll go to, to Dacey, and then from Dacey all the way out to the end of the project is the second piece. And the reason we're recommending that it be broken into two is because as we've looked at it and worked with the design engineers, that first piece of BB is very uh, woven into, it's very connected to one of the Kohler's projects. And so while those both those pieces of BB Road are right now on the same schedule and they will be administered as one. We thought it was safe to break the project into two at that at Daisy Lane in case there was an opportunity to accelerate one of the projects or in case one of the projects needed to, you know, to slow, uh, to slow down or take a different pace. Um, if you were to look at the piece of BB that goes from Dacey East, th that is where there are a lot more potentially affected properties. Um, and so that may take a little bit more time to figure out. And we didn't see a reason to slow the piece to the, uh, you know, that runs from the, uh, from the frontage road out to Dacey down if that were to happen. But I want to be, make sure you understand the intent is to not them have move them at at different paces, that is a safeguard in case either an opportunity comes up or a challenge comes up that causes us, you know, to be able to speed one up or if we have to just take our time with one. The second project, which is the Kohler's project, is broken into two pieces, and we had talked about this before. The first piece is the piece that crosses I-35, and we still have to figure out through the schematic process whether 35 will go over Kohler's or Kohler's will go over 35. But because that involves the interstate and its frontage roads, uh, there's a whole lot of coordination that needs to be done with TxDOT. That project will, although we'll move it as quickly as we can, that project will take a little bit longer than the piece that goes from the frontage road all the way south into Seton, which we call uh, internally you know, the part that goes over the caraway track. Um, that does not involve TxDOT. Uh, there's a lot less coordination, and those projects, just by their very nature, will move it at two separate 
uh, paces. Um, and that's the, the five items you have in front of you are those, again, three projects, two of them have two pieces each. And I've tried to cover briefly why we separated BB and why Kohler's remains separated into two chunks. And there's, I, I could answer uh, any questions you might have. All right, have. thank you, Mr. Cantalupo. Does anybody have any questions? Councilor Parsley. Um, so when we were doing the road bonds um, open house, I remember seeing bike lanes in all of these roads. I just want to make sure that the engineering includes bike lanes. Yes, the projects, the piece, the segments, the projects that we're presenting tonight, right, what we've seen in the open houses and what we've talked about with council remain unchanged. Okay. And, and the purpose really of the schematic process is to make sure that, you know, the, the city, the council is still on, I was going to say path, but I didn't mean <laughs> the pun, to, to make sure that you're still on that path. Okay. I just wanted to make sure it's something that it matters to a lot of the residents right now, yeah. and it's, some, it's a safety issue, something I've been wanting to hopefully implement in any new development that comes with, you know, any sort of infrastructure to add the bike lanes. So it, it is super important they for are, those to be. They are as they appeared, as we've talked about. Some of the projects have sidewalks. Some of them have the vibe. It just depends on, on which one. Okay. Um, and so with that, I would like to make a motion to approve... Items 19 through 23. Second. All right, that motion is made by Councilmember Parsley, seconded by the mayor that we approve agenda items 19 through 23. Is there discussion on the motion? Councilmember Zuniga. Yes, yeah, so um, I just had some quick questions. Sure. So we're approving these task orders. They're close to $4 million. Uh, is this in addition to the carved out $40 million from the Two ninety-seven million dollar road bonds. So, unless my math is wrong, and it very well could be, I'm not known for. My is this math. part of the forty, or is this plus? No, no, it's it's coming out. That that forty mm -hmm. million that you guys right, took in terms deposit. of bonds mm -hmm. made the money available. So this is drawing down on that forty million. Okay. And maybe Provost wants to add to that. Yes, sir. To answer your question. We issued 45 million. Okay, right. So these monies for these engineering contracts, up to 30%, will be coming from that bond proceed. Okay. Uh, second question is um, we haven't made any uh, priorities on which roads yet, right, to, to start on. And I know we had the discussion on needing to get urgency on that water easement or the water line one, which was kind of a, a major thing to get for the city? So, yes, council member, there is no priority basically because all the projects are launching at, at once, right? Mm -hmm. We'll be back, hopefully, well, we're planning on coming back next council meeting with the remaining, with the remainder of the design contracts. But they're all starting at once. That's why you have the capacity with all the design engineers and with the GEC, so we could get these all started at, at once. Now, there are a couple of projects, right, one in particular that has some issues with the Alliance Regional Water right. Line. We stay in touch with them to make sure that uh, we can go at the pace we're going and to make sure that they can still give us time. So we'll come back next week with the rest of the design contracts, and one of the first things we'll do, not that we're accelerating that project ahead of the others, but is to make sure that the design engineers and our team get alliance what they need. But Alliance knows if they can't wait any longer that we will internally, again, w just with the GEC team, we will help them make a decision. But right now, everyone's preference is to see if we can wait for the design team to get started, because that's the best way to do it. But be assured that if we have to, we will take a little bit of that work to our team before the design engineer gets under contract, and we will figure out with Alliance where it goes. But, but it's coordinated, right. so please, please, it, you know, Keep that in no, mind. no, I, I think you're doing a really good job. I, I like how you've broken it up, broke, broke it up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mayor Pratim. Uh, Mayor, this seems so surreal. <laughs> I mean, uh, we're actually finally talking about engineering in these very, very much needed deteriorating roads that we drive on every day especially east of Kyle. 
it's like a, a long, long time coming for for these uh, our residents out there, and uh, just seeing Bunting Creek to Layman, um, BB Road to Daisy Lane, and then again and so forth. Um, it, it's it's just the years of advocacy that I know I've done on my part to to let the residents know we hear you. We understand the traffic situations. We understand the, the deterioration of the roads and the much needed. So it's the, to me, this is just uh, um, an, an, another kind of um, surreal for me that we're actually going forward in seeing these roads starting to get to the construction phase. But uh, I do have a question on 21 and 20, no, I mean 22 and 23. So when it comes to the closed crossings and I-35, you said we're still waiting on getting some clearance from TxDOT, correct? Because it is a state road. So whether we design over it, under it, or however we do it, uh, we would have to continue to work with them on that. Now the question would be to the rest of us is, is there any federal money that we could eventually use or state money that could be able to eventually help offset that if when we go to the table for negotiations on the engineering phases. Uh, I know we've uh, recently had conversations with our congressman about uh, our infrastructure. I wonder if uh, our congressman is aware of these roads and uh, could be able to look into if we are be able to get additional funding to where we can offset some of that bond pricing. So I want to make sure that when we're talking about these, this particular area, whether it's the overpass, underpass of Kohler's, that we have everybody at the table to where we can be able to see how we can fund it and make sure we do it accordingly. Because in due time, if we do start this construction on Kohler's years to come, it will have an imperative to the traffic on 35 going north and southbound lanes because of this bridge or this overpass that we need. Um, so that is something that council and, and the residents need to keep in mind when we go forward with these projects that we're doing when we go over H35. We got to make sure that we are aware and prepared for traffic that would back up years from now due to our construction. So it's something to keep in mind. But if we can make sure that we, going forward, when it comes to this specific area of Kohler's and Seton Parkway, uh, we have everybody at the table, including uh, any kind of funding and federal and state money we can get to help some of this off offset the costs. So if, if I can comment, one of the things we've done to this point as we've started to get to the point of being able to offer design contracts for council's consideration, is we've had some um, informal coordination uh, with TxDOT, and one of the things they told us early on was th they're the, the folks who got us on, again, the path, on the path of separating colors into two pieces, and their logic was do um, uh, uh, an advanced funding agreement, that's the agreement that allows a city or county to work on a state facility, do an agreement for design, and then do a separate agreement for construction. Now, there are lots of reasons why they suggested that, but one of the reasons they suggested it was that if you separate the construction out, there's a, a, a greater opportunity, and it's actually a little bit easier to go seek additional funding to try and offset some of the construction costs. So we've started early already thinking about that in terms of how we're going to approach the city entering entering into agreements with TxDOT. I hope that makes sense. And I, I just want to add to that, actually, because it was the it was the number one priority of uh, our conversations with um, Mr. Kassar uh, in the conversation was to, and also we're having these conversations with Campo as well. The idea is if we can match, if we could get a 50% funding on the construction of the underpass, uh, that would free up funding to potentially construct the uh, overpass or underpass the other I-35 crossing project. Mm -hmm. So get a two for one. Uh, that's certainly been the, my goal. I wish we could have funded them both, um, but but I, I I think that is the plan, at least is certainly to give that our best effort. Is there any other discussion? Customer Forsko. 
All right, thank you. I just have hopefully just two short questions. Um, is there a reason why they weren't all put on the same agenda? Uh, yes, Council Member. We um, the, the simply stated the others weren't ready. What we're trying to do is uh, be thorough um, and comfortable with how the design con contracts are put together. And our feeling was that we'd rather take an extra two weeks for the rest of them and have those as tight and as buttoned up as possible than rush to get them all here and then have to come back because uh, you know we overlooked something or missed something. And that's that is the, you know the only reason we're just trying to be thorough and careful because we don't want something small to haunt us, you know, weeks and months from now. Okay. Um, so I, I'm looking. I like to use this as a reference. So I don't know. Um, when I was reading the agenda, when I say this, it's going to be the program overview where okay. it was like project I, I numbered. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if we can kind of incorporate that into the agenda items for future because it. I had, it took me a minute to realize like these two were together and these two were together. So, um, and, and I was just trying to figure out like the cost. I will say my concern is we have passed a $294.4 million, million dollar bond and now we're looking at $5 million, and at no point have I seen any backup for how, why things cost the way they do. So moving forward, I would like to see a breakdown invoices like it looks like here we're going to use to American Structure Point, LJA Engineering, and then BGE Inc. Um, I would like to see something in the backup that states where this $947,810 is going to. Um, I, I'm excited. Um, I'm excited to know that there's no particular order right now and that we're gonna do the other ones hopefully by the next um, agenda. But again, my concern is just not being able to lay eyes on how much and where the costs are going. Because if we had some backup, I think Daniela would have been able to see that hopefully there is some bike paths included in that. And I could see, you know, where there's lights. That's it. We did see it on the first one. The price? The first one. The first meeting. Uh, yeah. Any additional discussion? Uh, I just, I wanted to note, because this is kind of a seminal moment for me, uh, the, you know, the, 30% schematic designs for the majority of the 2013 road bonds that were passed uh, came in 2016, 2015, 16, 2015. So two years after the bond was passed, and here we are three months after the bond is passed. So it just goes to show we, we waited a year to go, take it to the voters so that we could prepare this bond program to roll it out very intentionally. Uh, and uh, the, I, think the, I think the residents if they were really paying attention, would recognize that uh, we're moving uh, uh, very systematically and thoroughly and, and mm -hmm. expeditiously to construct these roads because they're not going to get cheaper if we wait multiple years. Uh, and I love our approach. I love the way that I love the strategy and how we're breaking these roads down for engineering and right-of-way acquisition on all of them to move them all to the next step. Uh, I, I love everything about it, and I do also look forward to additional roads coming forward. Uh, in the future. Uh, additional discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Our motion carries seven to zero. Thank, Thank you, Jeff. You. All right, next up, we're going to have agenda item 30, considering possible action to direct staff to work with Hayes Caldwell Women's Center to negotiate a contract <laughs> for services provided to residents of Kyle on a yearly basis and to identify funding sources that does not exceed $15,000 to fund services for the remainder of the fiscal year 2022-2023. Councilmember Parsley and Councilmember Heiser, I don't know who wants to go first. Councilor Heiser, no, oh, Councilor Parson. Is there any way that we can put the presentation or the backup material on the screen? Thank you. All right, so I'm, I'm just gonna say my words. Um, I feel like there are great organizations and then there are really remarkable ones like the Hayes Cowboy Women's Center. Um, and although I was I always knew that you guys did amazing work and that you helped, you really provided with fantastic help to so many families. You know, you provide education, you provide therapy, uh, living arrangements, uh, visiting their facilities, and seeing face to face the females that that living here. And it's not only women, I know, um, but they find a home and a family with you guys. It it was really wonderful. Um, I appreciate Melissa that she's here today and Michelle Dakoti because they were able to facilitate for Council Member Heiser and I to uh, take a visit. 
Um, but what, I, what we really want to show you is um, how we are using these facilities. So if I can see the presentation. It was really shocking to us that um, about 460 members of Kyle visit these facilities. Um, we have had 157 victims of domestic violence and abuse. Um, and I believe we are number two users. I mean, the residents of Kyle, um, we are the second one. Uh, and we are the first one in victims of sexual assault um, as children, correct? So the city of Kyle used to give some funding to the Hayes Cowell Women's Center, and we are not longer doing that. Um, we haven't been doing this for years. Um, and we are utilizing their services basically daily. Um, I noticed that a lot of, uh, every, basically every city surrounding us does give some funding to them, but us, which was quite embarrassing to me. Um, so I would like to see what we can do to partner up with them and seeing if there is any funding that we can provide. I know we have budget season coming and that will be the best way to go about it. Um, but it's been about six, seven years. And so I'm gonna yield the floor to Council Member Heiser now. Yeah, um, excuse me. I uh, Your microphone. definitely agree with her sentiment uh, in terms of the, the reason why we brought this to the floor tonight. In regards to the services provided, uh, you know, I can come in my business experience, you, if someone provides a service for you, you compensate them for the service. And given that we have not contributed to uh, their yearly budget, it's something that I very much would like to see given uh, the importance uh, in the, to the community and to the kids and the adults who are um, served at this facility. Uh, these are some very trying times for these uh, for these victims, and uh, anything that we can do to make that experience uh, more uh, is something that's, e uh, I guess, just saying that make the process better for them. And in terms of services provided, I'd like to look at it in terms of a contract uh, that we would uh, staff you know, is walking away from this, would look to see how we could engage in a contract for those services provided. So that is something that is, could be solidified in, in our budgeting process for, for next year. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you for the patience. Right, Councilmember Zuniga. Yeah, so I do have a question about this. So um, it might be for staff. Uh, why was this program defunded back in uh, 2016 with zero dollars? Uh, is it because we pay money to Hayes County or, and the other question is, um, are we asking to uh, fund them for 15,000? I, I don't know, or are we asking to find sources of funding up to 15,000? I, I don't understand what we're asking. Oh. We haven't done the motion yet, but um, so part of what we wanted to do was to direct staff to get into a contract, a conversation with the Hayes Calvert Women's Center to see um, if there is any source of funding that we can uh, get into with them for future budgets, um, and then try to find about $15,000 within the current budget if there is any availability um, to try to compensate for some of what we haven't been donating or given to them over the last few years. Right, it's like retro, so I, I agree with that, but I, I still wanna know why did we stop um, putting funds into a very important program that our residents are benefiting from? Because we were doing it for five years and then we stopped doing it. And it's not, not, not to, not to just kind of ask the question. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council for the Record, Jerry Hendricks, Interim City Manager. There was a period of time where the Council allocated $30,000 in the annual budget to go towards a community grants program that was administered in a manner where we solicited proposals. There's a committee 
form that reviewed those proposals and interviewed the applicants and uh, awarded the money um, as they deemed appropriate with council approval. After five years, the council chose not to fund the program any longer, so it's discontinued. Do we still have the thirty thousand no. for grants funds? No. We have. No, do we have zero? Yes, sir. In a grant program. It is removed from the budget. May I say something? Customer Parsons. Okay, Actually, so uh, Customer Floors Kill. Okay. You can have the floor. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so um, I will say, initially I was hesitant for this because I didn't quite understand that it was a service agreement. Um, traditionally, and I hate to say traditional because things change, but um, I think when we talk about donations, it's different than a service agreement. Mm -hmm. And I have, I completely 110% support this. I'm hoping that we can do a lot more than 15,000, and I'm hoping it, it comes from, you know, our general fund by way of like, um, not affecting any departments. Um, I, I took a tour of the of the Hayes Caldwell. This is an amazing, amazing place. It's, it's a safe place for not just women, but men and also children, most importantly, the children. Um, and so nobody has to convince me to try to do a service agreement with this organization. My belief is we already use these services. And so because we do that, it's important that we uh, support and help maintain whatever services they provide. So um, with that, I'd like to make a motion to have staff bring back um, funding, like an amount of funding. A bag of money. <laughs> <laughs> and not just from the general fund, not out of any department fund. Um, and, and, and maybe not capped. If you want to, if you, you know, I don't want to say unlimited, but I also don't want to say, um, I don't want to limit to 15,000 if we have that possibility. Um, and and it, can, it can be brought back at the next meeting. Okay, so. Um, Hang on, there's a, there's a motion on the floor to bring back uh, some amount of funding, uh, not unlimited, but some <laughs> large amount of funding to yeah, give to Hayes Call Women's Center. Is there a uh, second? A second. All right, uh, motion is made by Councilmember Force Kale, seconded by Councilmember Parsley. Is there a discussion on the motion? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, it, I think it's good that we really kind of look at this once more again. Uh, it, it would be able to provide services for the residents that we have over there, offset some of the cost. And, and I have faith that uh, the, the we could be able to have the funds already available. And mm -hmm. so, um, once we start with budget talks in the next uh, month or so, uh, we could bring that proposal forward. And again, it's a matter of seeing, working with the center themselves to see not so much, here's a check, use it for what you need, but maybe we can go ahead and partner with them if there's other services that they could provide as well. So that way uh, we can allot the tax dollars money that we have that we're giving to them uh, we can be able to actually hold each dollar accountable. And if it's services they need, food, counseling, whatever it is, we can at least have a rundown, yearly rundown, of, of where these, uh, these monies are going to. And if, they, and if it's needed to where we, we keep it at, at, at a cap or we need to increase it due to the population that's uh, being utilized, uh, we can go forward on that. But I... I do have faith that uh, I think there is, is a, a route that we can go to where we already have the funding available. Customer Bradshaw. I just think that saying unlimited is a very vague direction. Mm -hmm. and oh, I said not unlimited. Okay, so do, okay, so I, I let think me we get need this to come up with, with an amount. Number. Can we match okay. Buda? For, can I ask, no. first of all, no. can I have you come yeah, up? Buda doesn't Kate even use her services that much. <laughs> um, do you have a service agreement with any other city? They're not considered service agreements. I'm sorry, Melissa Rodriguez. I'm the chief executive officer for the Hayes Caldwell Women's Center. Um, we have a grant funding process that we go through, same that we used to with the city of Kyle. Um, every city has a pot of money that they designate for these kind of services. Now, there are smaller cities, Luling, for example, not a lot of money in their budget. They don't have a process, but they make a donation, and they just choose an amount based on their budgets. Um, so it varies. It depends on the city and their capabilities of what they can fund. 
Okay, so for me, donation is a slippery slope. Um, <laughs> yes, and we've talked about this, and you know, I am big on donations. I think it's important. Over the last two and a half years, I've realized that is a really, that's why I like the service agreement. Um, so I am gonna amend my motion. Well, but, but, <laughs> but hang on, Councilmember Bradshaw okay. had the floor. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying that. I would mm -hmm. love to move forward with a service agreement because mm -hmm. when we open up the door and the window for grants and donations and 100%. things like that, it becomes more universal than just wanting to contribute to the services that Kyle residents use at your facility. So I think that if you want to amend your motion, amend your motion yes. fine, <laughs> but I definitely think that it needs to be worded in some form of a, some some wording around a service agreement rather than donations made. And can I just add to uh, Councilman uh, Tobias, you mentioned uh, accountability, and that is something that we're able to provide. I mean, obviously you have some statistics, but we do quarterly reports for other cities, whatever is required, we're happy to give that information. The cost that you see, uh, the amount is a really conservative amount based on the services that we are providing. Um, at the center, but you're you're right. It it does open the door, and so we I understand that you are responsible for city funding and want to ensure that the investment is being made in the way that it needs to be for the residents. So we would be happy to do that as well. Can we amend the motion? Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that right now. I want to amend my motion um, to direct staff to draft a service agreement with the Hayes Caldwell Women's Center. Um, and I'm going to say for $15,000 for the remainder of the fiscal year 2022 to 2023. Is that it? Better. And Motion. then start communication, communicating with them for the next fiscal year. Yes, we can talk about that at the budget. Okay, second. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so the motion is made by Councilmember Flores Kale, seconded by Councilmember Parsley, that we direct staff to enter into a professional services contract with Hayes Caldwell Women's Center for $15,000 for services provided for this budget year and to direct staff to bring back uh, and have conversations with and prepare for extending that beyond uh, this current fiscal year. Is there discussion on the motion? I got some. Just briefly. And I'm going to vote yes. I'm going to support this. But I know the, where this is going. The well, the question was, um, well, Why? look. Why was it cut? Look, $5,000 for years, and then it stopped uh, two weeks after I was elected in 2016. So if anybody wants to know the history, here it is. I apologize. I've been around a long time. And so what I've seen through the years is that city councils in general and their mindset and mentality towards these kind of things move. And so this is a situation where the entire council was here, the entire council moved to here, and now the entire council has moved back to here. And so I'm just going to be the word of caution here. So the Hayes Caldwell Women's Center, I sponsored their proclamations every year. I'm a huge supporter, a big fan. I also 100% agreed with cutting the $30,000 that we were giving out based on sort of the committee and council. But it, and for the, all the reasons that we saw in the last budget cycle, when every budget year since then, there has been discussions about giving away money to nonprofits, giving away, however you want to say it, I don't mean that derogatorily, but supporting nonprofits through the budget process. And every time we have those discussions, many, many wonderful nonprofits come to make their very heartfelt and compelling pleas to the city council. And every uh, organization that is being funded is asking for more, and those that aren't being funded are saying, why can't we be funded? And they all put pressure on council. Council wants, and council jockeys for their position, their, their nonprofit that they, they want to see, that they care about, because I can give you a list of five or six that are also wonderful organizations on par with the Hayes Caldwell Women's Center. Not above, I think you're number one, but I think there are some one Bs uh, in, the, in the community, and you will find them. And so this is a situation where what is likely to happen over time is that this budget item will increase. The politics around the item uh, will increase to the point where a city council who's giving away $30,000 a year could be so frustrated by the politics that they would kill it. And that's what happened. I will also remind everyone that in, 20, 000, in 2016, I was not uh, the, the mayor who'd been around a long time. I was two weeks in and was uh, literally, I was elected in June and we were having our first budget workshop in June. So my first meetings were 
these these particular items. And so that's just that's all the background we need to. I think the commentary about making sure that if we're going to be supporting nonprofits, that we do tie them to professional services agreements with compelling uh, data and services that are being provided is important. There are other organizations in the city of Kyle who will make exactly the argument that we are providing serv that we are taking from them because they are working in our community and providing resources to people in our community and the city of Kyle is not giving them anything in the exact same way that the Hayes Caldwell Women's Center is making that argument. And so to be prepared, you know, I have been very consistent from 2016 to 2023 that this is not something I have wanted to support. Up until this point, the council has had the discussions and ultimately stayed in that position. Uh, but we have, we've, we've moved more to the left on that. And so that's totally fine. Uh, just gonna have to deal with it as we move forward. So good luck uh, for the coming budget season when <laughs> folks come asking for things. That's my, that's my piece. And I do apologize if it feels like the Hayes Caldwell Women's Center wasn't getting their fair cut. Uh, at, least, at least I get to tell you that was, a, that was our mentality. There are many other nonprofits in the, in the organization, or in the city, so. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries seven to zero. All right, next up is agenda item 24, considering possible action to approve a resolution of the city of Kyle, Texas, amending the contract for uh, Kyle, Texas 3.14 ADA transportation program with Maruti Transportation Group, ex uh, executed April 5th, 2022. Mr. Hendricks. Mayor, Mayor Pertem, Council, for the record, Jerry Hendricks, Interim City Manager. Before you is a resolution amending our existing contract with Maruti. There's a number of different parts to this. One is um, a number of different uh, service improvements that will be brought online with this resolution, and also some, some price adjustments that kind of bring um, what they're charging for the service more into reality of what the service cost. You see in the backup in the scope of services, which is Exhibit B, the additional program um, additions or service hours are increased from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. and also adding 24-7 access with uh, after, with a after hours service option. Uh, currently the service is not available on weekends. This adds weekend transportation as part of the regular service hours. Uh, there's currently no project management team and this will provide for a service management team that, that um, communicates directly with Uber and improves our, our current dashboard and our, our Kyle 314 maintenance program. Compliance uh, management, make sure we're in compliance with all uh, reporting, integration, voucher distribution, and all the Title II ADA compliance. Um, currently, there's no vehicle branding. This will give us the option to actually brand the vehicles that are servicing Kyle where they they uh, are branded to represent our program. Uh, vehicle program scalability, there was no none of that in the current, but uh, additional paratransit vehicles are gonna be added to the fleet to make sure that we're able to meet the increased demand and all compliance standards. And transportation scheduling, we're gonna expand the dispatching capability to allow for after hours and the weekend scheduling. Uh, so lots of new uh, services, coming with this uh, amendment to the contract. From a price standpoint, we're going from a $12 per trip loading fee to a $30, which represents more what the actual cost is for the company, and a slight increase in our per mile fee from $3.50 to $3.75. So we have ample room in our budget to cover that for the remainder of this year. Uh, we're gonna have to look really closely at growth of the program in this coming budget to make sure that we continue to have funds to provide the service and what expansions we want to do. I'm available for any questions if you have any. Uh, anybody have any questions for Mr. Hendricks? Councilmember Florsco. Um, so when will this extend to? This uh, resolution also has an uh, evergreen amendment that uh, keeps the contract going perpetually with built-in price increases as the CPI warrants and any party can amend it with proper notice or can end it with proper notice. All right, so um, I do appreciate all the work that you've done and all the um, additional stuff we got. W something that I really, really want to see is the 
vehicle branding so people understand that this is what we're using yeah. in the city of Kyle. I'm really looking forward to um, that too. That's going to be cool. So I guess is there? A, I have three questions. Is there a timeline? Is there going to be paid for by Kyle, and who will oversee it? I'll oversee it. Okay. Um, timeline is as soon as we can get it done. What was the third question? Um, is it going to be paid for by Kyle, the branding options? I'm going to go with Maruti's going to pay for it. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's, that's it. I'd like to make a motion to approve agenda item number 24, please. Second. Motion by Councilmember Flores Kale, second by Councilmember Parsley. Is there that we approve agenda item 24? Is there discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Seven to zero. Next up is Thank agenda you. item 25, first reading, an ordinance of the city of Cal, Texas, repealing article two, alcoholic beverages, division two, permits and license, licenses, sections 11.42, license and permit fees, uh, 11.43, payment and fees, 1144 review and recommendation, amending 1147, violations and penalties, uh, et cetera. This is related to TA uh, alcohol fees. Apparently we have to amend our ordinance now. Correct, Mayor, Mayor Council page sign. City Attorney, for the record, the this ordinance implements the council's action from February 7th to not charge the uh, TABC fees. So this ordinance repeals the provisions of your code that would charge those, those fees and enforce and implement those fees. All right, there's the discussion. Uh, Councilmember Heiser. This is something that I voted, uh, well, I voted to, uh, to not collect these fees based on some outstanding questions that I had that I didn't feel like I was getting answers for. And as in preparation for this meeting, uh, you know, I, I still feel like I don't have those answers. Therefore, I, I, I don't believe it is, is something that we should be pulling out of our code right now. Especially if not knowing how much increased permitting revenue would come in with all the additional businesses that are about to open up in the next couple of years. So I just want to put that out there for the rest of council to consider. Uh, it's kind of punting, but at the same time, you know, this was something, this is something that could generate revenue for the city and, uh, I just want to be really responsible, given it is a um, it is a burden for uh, businesses, especially small businesses who are looking to get off the ground. And w one thing I would like to see with um, or discuss is is having these fees be proportionate to the the revenue that um, that a business is expected to to bring in from alcohol sales, so that the bigger businesses that have a higher volume. Uh, will be paying more in permitting fees versus a small business is not paying uh, a, a larger percentage of their overall volume of sales. Uh, so just want to throw that out there for the rest of council. I, I don't think it's a variable rate fee. I think it's a flat fee regardless. It's just a permit fee. So uh, uh, any discussion? Councilor Florsko. Um, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page that this is going to say we're taking it out. There is no discussion about a very, like different prices or fees. This is ultimately going to be like, hey, we're not doing this right now. Um, I think I would eventually like to, to bring it back and like put it in slowly. Um, and so if that's you know if that's what Councilmember Heiser is talking about, I, I understand. But I just want to make sure when we vote on this, we're all of the understanding that this means we're not going to do it. Um, but hopefully with um, some kind of maybe during budget we can start talking about how we can re-implement that so it's going to kind of be a pain to like make this ordinance and then and make then take and it then amend it again so um but if this is what we have to do then, then i'd like to make a motion to uh, approve agenda item number 25. motion by councilman flores kale is there a second <laughs> second by councilman bradshaw we approve agenda item 25. Is there a discussion on the motion? I just want to say that a no vote pairs really well with the yes vote that we just took. It allows for us to deliver a balanced uh, council meeting in terms of how we are spending our money. So, um, Councilman Heiser. Yeah, I, I'm just saying, why would we go through the motions of pulling it out of, of 
the code right now if it's not if it's still something we're going to evaluate moving forward. It's as it's a simple, we're charging these or we're not charging these fees, make a decision. It's that's the way it has to be. Yeah, but if we haven't been charging it for seven, tw nine years, so to, to take it out now versus waiting until we have more information and then making a, a more informed decision as to whether we want to completely remove this, uh, that's, I believe, would be the better, more efficient path well, forward. But, but what you're saying is you want to leave uh, uh, a, a law or a rule in place that we're not following. And the reason it was brought forward in the first place was because there was a law in place that we weren't following. Yeah. And we said, okay, the question was, hey, let's be consistent. If we don't want to charge these fees, we're going to change our ordinance so that we don't charge them. If we are going to charge the fees, we need, we need to charge the fees. Just simple. We need direction to charge them, in which case we wouldn't have had to even bring this item forward. But we made a vote at the last meeting, or a couple meetings ago, or whatever it was, that we didn't want to collect these fees, and so now we have to change our laws to be consistent with the direction that we just gave. So, anyway, is there any further discussion? No. All right, roll call vote. Bradshaw? Aye. Zuniga? Aye. Mitchell? No. Tobias? Nay. Heiser? Nay. Yeah, right. Yes. Nay. Nay. Sorry. Flores-Kale? Yes. Parsley? Nay. I'm changing mine back to a nay. I, I misunderstood earlier. Is that okay? All right, so hang on. So the motion failed three to four. Uh, and so you, you're in Name for you. Let's not bring this back. We weren't following it, wasn't it? Nay is like no. I got so so and so let's. <laughs> got confused. This has been this has been interesting. So <laughs> a nay vote fails the ordinance. The ordinance does not change. The fees stay on the books, which means oh. the direction will be to, to charge. charge the fees. Mm -hmm. So nay means charge the fees. Yes. Yeah. So you're good with your vote. What did I vote? You voted I yes. What I voted. You voted yes, which is consistent. You stayed consistent from the okay, first time. Okay, yeah, because I was consistent. You're good. I didn't want to charge it. I'm, I'm, I'm misunderstood. All right, uh, I'm going to reconsider I this you, item. Actually, so then yes. so that's why I'm going to motion to reconsider. Uh, is there any objections to bringing this item back and recalling the vote? All right, seeing none. So the motion is to approve the item repealing the ordinance that it currently is in place that charges the fees. And I technically do the... Vote on the motion to reconsider. All right, I have a motion to reconsider. Second. Motion by the mayor, second by Council Member Parsley. Is there any discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries seven to zero. So I'd like to, I'll make it clear uh, in, in, in the motion. I'd like to make a motion to deny agenda item 25 repealing and to direct staff to implement. Uh, the policy on the books and begin charging the fees. Second. Second. Motion by the mayor, seconded by Councilmember Parsley. Is there discussion on the motion? Roll call vote. Flores Kale? I do not want to deny. <laughs> if that makes sense. That's a nay. Nay. <laughs> Parsley? Yes. Zuniga? No. Mitchell? Yes. Heiser? I'm a no. So here's Tobias. I, I said no. So I said no. I, just, I don't want to come. We have a roll call vote. Hang on. We have, hang on. We have a roll call, have a roll call vote, please. Come on. Bradshaw? Aye. All right. Was that all of them? All right, motion carries four to three. That was interesting. All so right. We're gonna, we are going to charge. Yes. How does that work with the last vote that we took? It, it would be like having a development agreement without the zoning. You can't do one without, like, we, we took a vote. To direct to, staff to do an ordinance. And now we're denying the ordinance. Oh, right. Yeah, what was, I guess what was, no, I think we took a vote not to charge. That was the motion that was made, but it there was no ordinance before us. So the, the way that that's implemented is in direction to bring back an ordinance, which was brought back and was just denied. So then how do we know how much we charge? 
The fund. ordinance charges 50% of the state fee. But our vote for the last time was no, we're not charging that. So that still stands as does this no vote to this. No, that you, have, you have an ordinance on the books that you've reaffirmed. That With charges. direction to staff to, imp, to charge the fees. Correct. Which that over, was, that overrules the, the was. original. That was in the motion. So. All right, is there discussion? Well, no, it's, that part is over. All right, let's get to the good one. Let's go. Agenda item number 26, discussion of possible action regarding 2020 Prop F ordinance presented to council on June 15th, 2021, referencing the 2020 Prop F bond language to include but not limited to creating a committee name. Hey, I need to call order, sorry, please. Uh, creating committee name requirements for a committee seat selection and committee mission statement. This item is sponsored by Councilmember Force Kale, Councilmember and Mayor Pro Tem. Either one of you wish, wish to go first? All right, Councilmember Flores. Uh, just, I just want to. Um, so Prop F was passed in 2020, um, and um, yeah, it's kind of got the ball dropped. I know last year, uh, Councilmember Ellison um, had met with me, and there was an ordinance. I think that was presented to Council. Um, that ordinance, I don't think, was ever voted on, but no one can find it. I believe there was an open house. Um, I asked for that feedback from the open house. I never received it. Um, so I think what we need to do collectively as a council is to figure out, uh, it, hopefully you read the bond language, um, but to figure out what where it is, what we want this um, Prop F to look like. Um, and in that, I, I listed the stuff that we needed to do, which was, you know, we needed to create a committee name. If we even want to do that, I don't know if we want to tack this on to another committee. Uh, there's a civil service committee that already exists. Um, and I, I feel like a lot of these things can be done with an already, with the civil service committee. Um, we get our reports. For, for me, I feel like it's easy to see why this ball was kind of dropped. We are blessed as a city not to have the police department issues um, that other cities have. Um, I used to live about two, two hours from Chicago, Illinois, and so I do realize that, um, I, I don't want to say corruption, but I do realize that there are issues with police departments. Uh, we do not have that, and so for that reason, I feel like um, we, we didn't, that's how this was overlooked. Um, it looks like, Mayor Mitchell. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know I was going to jump up that fast. I was just getting ready. No, I, I do appreciate this because, um, yep. you know, staff asked council to place it back on the agenda. Um, and that's why I asked council member Tobias because he was here as was Mayor Mitchell during this, the, the creation of the bond language. And so um, yeah, I'm ecstatic that you have some stuff already up there for me and I appreciate it. Um, if, it's, if it's okay with Mayor Pro Tem, I have some have some slides to go through so sure. I, I just just as an FYI I, I want to appreciate just say thank you to both of you for bringing it forward uh, if y'all if y'all hadn't sponsored that I probably would have as well uh, I do I do think that it's long time coming and so I appreciate the fact that we're we're now trying to take this seriously um, you know I'm con you know just spoken to the last item about how I've been involved now with seven budgets and we're about to start my eighth budget cycle but this is uh, a situation where in all the years for every council and mayor election and every proposition every bond uh in my i in my memory since i've been around at least no item has received more support uh at the ballot box than proposition f uh and proposition f was very well worded uh when it went to the ballot box it was very clear uh and the the language in the city charter i believe is also really clear so what i wanted to do is i take about 10 minutes uh, and go through sort of a series of a narrative and uh, an education piece and then see if potentially we can sort of arrive at uh, some heading that I think maybe ultimately we might could all agree to. So uh, first I just want to read the language that is in the charter uh, today. So the City of Kyle Police Department shall collaborate with a committee established by the City Council to have oversight over the development of standard operating policies and strategies, providing timely data sharing and deploying resources that aim to protect all citizens, businesses and property within the city, promote transparency within the police department to the community, 
to also include data sharing communication in the forms of in-person briefings, news publications, and social media on a quarterly basis, and reduce crime by increasing positive community engagement and promoting cooperation with all citizens through training, education, and community policing models. Annually, the police chief or designee shall provide the, the full city council with a comprehensive report about police department operations, crime statistics, uh, training initiatives, and other information requested by the city council. The city council shall adopt an ordinance implementing the terms of this subsection. So I believe that's been 27 months ago, roughly 28 months ago, uh, when this was uh, passed by the voters. And uh, thus far, none of this has taken place because the first step is the last sentence. The city council shall adopt an ordinance implementing the terms of this subsection. City council never implemented said ordinance. Therefore, the responsibility for the lack of implementation of Prop F lies on the council. And obviously, because I've been here, I take some responsibility. I, I do think Councilmember flores Kell is correct uh, that there's, there's just a lot of potential pitfalls in uh, um, how we might want to approach this that I sense in all of my colleagues uh, not wanting to pass uh, an oversight committee policy that causes problems where there weren't one. I believe that was the uh, phrase that Assistant Chief Hernandez uh, mentioned to me the other day, which I immediately agreed with. Don't want to cause problems when there aren't problems. Uh, I want to point out uh, there are three uses of the word data sharing or statistics. Uh, so to me, when you repeat something multiple times uh, in the language, that's probably something to pay attention to. So uh, timely data sharing, uh, you see, and then data sharing on a quarterly basis, and, uh, and then the comprehensive report, including the word uh, statistics. So I want to now go to how I'm going to try to take out the paragraph language and put it in a um, bullet point. So in my opinion, these are the key points lifted directly from the passage. And then I'm going to ask the council if they agree that that's what it said. So number one, KPD must collaborate. And I'm na I named it the Oversight Kyle Police Oversight Committee because that's the words directly from the charter. That is, is open. If we, we can name it the Sunshine Committee. I do not care. Uh, but they must collaborate uh, with the committee. Uh, number two, uh, the oversight committee must have oversight over the development of standard operating po uh, policies and strategies lifted directly from the charter. Number three is the, the committee must have oversight over data sharing, and that data sharing must be timely. Next is that the committee must have oversight regarding quarterly data sharing via in-person briefings, news publications, and social media. And then finally, the K uh, KPD must produce a comprehensive annual report covering the following topics, operations of KPD, crime statistics, training initiatives, and other information requested by the city council. So I wanted to stop here and just ask if, if anybody had issues with any of what has been written here as far as sort of the key points, because I took all of the language out that talks about positive community image, those kind of things, because those aren't key points. Those are the sort of the aspirations of the charter. Yeah, I have a question. Who Councilor created Florescale. that um, verbiage for the charter? Because it seems a little bit d different than what was actually voted on for Prop F. So I guess I, since I, I wasn't I wasn't here, I don't know. It seems like it's a little more stringent in the charter versus because I can read to you what the, the ballot said. Shall Article Seven, Section Seven Point Zero Six of the City Charter be amended to provide that police department procedures and policies shall, shall be subject to review and modification by the City Council to require the police chief to provide the city council with an annual report about police department operations and to provide for the city council to establish a committee, no name, committee with oversight over standard operating policies and strategies, data sharing and use of resources of the police department for the purpose of promoting public safety, transparency and crime reduction through community policy models. So that to me doesn't seem as stringent as 
the charter. So I guess my question is, who placed the verbiage in the charter? The, the, I, I don't. I don't really know what to what to say here. Okay, so I'm trying to get us to move forward. This is in the charter. This is the way that it is. The language from propositions, how the props are put on the ballot, is done through council, uh, SEL, and that that language is not what we uh, uh, discussed. The language that is here is what the council voted on. Okay, well, I'm just trying to honor what was voted on, but I see what you're saying. This is what we have. This to is do. in the charter. So what I'm trying to do is capture that, and I, I've got a whole path that I'm going down. I think you'll, you'll, you'll be okay with in the end, maybe. But at least let's get there. But I want we have to agree on what the charter says, not what the proposition was. The charter language is what is what matters. There, there are many things in the charter that get voted on through the years. So, all right. So. Um, so, I, like I said, I think that the the original char or the charter language provides for a few things that it talks about, and those uh, primarily have to do with data sharing. And that got me to mm -hmm. when I was reading it over and over again uh, over the last couple weeks. It got me to really thinking about the question of like what data is currently being shared by the police department. Uh, and is that enough? And if we were to be requesting more data, uh, what, what might that look like and, and why? And so I started looking at the budget, which is what I like to do. So I went through every budget that I have ever voted on. Uh, like I said, I voted on seven budgets. And I don't know, are y'all aware that there are performance measures that are included in every completed budget related to the Kyle Police Department? There are a total of eight performance measures. Now I'm gonna show you five of them. So the 2020-2021 the budget, uh, I think having to do with COVID, did not include the full report, uh, it, which had the performance measures by department. Uh, and then the current 2022-2023 budget perhaps is going to be uh, published later, at a later date, Pervez, is that right? Yeah, so that one will come forward with the updated performance measures. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, I, uh, there were missing, missing data points uh, in, the, uh, in the past uh, budgets, and so I've been emailing with the police department making requests uh, for the data. Uh, they've been working very diligently to provide uh, a accurate data going all the way back uh, to 2016 and 2017. So the five main uh, items for performance measures that I noticed were police reports, self-initiated activity, which is like traffic stops, traffic violations, which would be uh, tickets or citations issued, uh, arrests made, which is self-explanatory, 911 calls. Uh, one of the other categories was uh, dispatch uh, calls for service. So you call 911, that's one statistic. When uh, uh, dispatch is issued, that's a different uh, one. I didn't add that because it's very directly correlated to 911 calls. Uh, the other was, um, uh, w which had incomplete data, was the um, calls to the police department in general, ca civilian calls, uh, essentially. So, um, uh, and then the, uh, there, was one, there was one final one. I can't remember what it was, but it also had incomplete data. And so I only wanted to bring forward the statistics that were completed. So I started compiling, comparing, and sort of trying to analyze the data uh, and this is the way that it looked like over that year, over the period of time. So starting in 2016-17, uh, our population, according to the Google Maps, was 39,314. And then you can see uh, through the seven-year period, ending in the current estimate, which is on the Kyle Economic Development site, of 52,300. represents, over the course of the seven years, a uh, 33% increase in population. The budget... Uh, for the police department in total, that, so that's, that's sworn, non-sworn, uh, everything uh, from the general fund that goes to the police department uh, is listed uh, in the second item, starting at $6.2 million roughly in 2016-17, uh, increasing to $14.8 million in 2022 or 2023, which is an increase of just over $1.2 million every single year uh, for the police department's budget or a total percentage increase of 139%. Uh, ticket revenue, uh, which took me some time to figure out, because if you look at the police department's budget, uh, ticket uh, there is the, the revenue isn't listed there. It's listed in the municipal court uh, section of the budget. 
uh, ticket revenue is uh, increased by almost identical to the percentage of the population from 350,000 to 470,000 roughly, which the last year is an estimate. Uh, and then th there are the actual performance measures. Uh, and you can see, which they, they all kind of shocked me. To, to me, the one that is uh, least prone to having any kind of manipulation by external factors, such as changes in policies, uh, changes in the district attorney's views towards items, or how the police uh, file reports is the 911 calls. So I, interesting, and there, it's a very steady increase as our population increased, uh, but it didn't even, it didn't increase as much as our population, so 26 percent. Uh, and then the remaining uh, four categories, arrests, traffic violations, self-initiated activity and police reports, uh, either maintained over the course of the entire seven years or actually uh, declined. So I will just tell you that I had conversations with Chief uh, with Captain or with Assistant Chief and with others about some of this data because it bothered me, frankly, that the numbers weren't going up commensurate with the budget or with the population. Uh, and there were very good responses the, that they had to give about changes in policies. Like, for example, uh, if there's a fender bender, uh, you know, two vehicles get into a crash at an intersection in the past, uh, that would generate a police report and a crash report. Uh, but the, the, at some point along the line, uh, the, uh, the police department changed the way they reported uh, and no longer uh, did full-on police reports unless there was, um, you know, uh, uh, some violence or injury or something that was sort of more of an escalated um, situation. So that made an impact. You know, there were conversations about, from the standpoint of arrests, that potentially that COVID played uh, a, a role there, as well as uh, changes in uh, policies from the district attorney or changes in state law uh, that might uh, have an impact and that obviously not all arrests are the same. And sometimes you're making arrests, uh, you're doing a case and f uh, folks are outside of your jurisdiction uh, when they are arrested. And so that caller is not necessarily yours. Uh, lots of different sort of anecdotes, uh, but the data uh, is right here before us. And so the question really sort of became, and, and this is something that Chief and Assistant Chief brought up right away uh, in the conversations that I had, and it's like, this isn't really capturing everything quite right because there are elements, like there are uh, it, parts of our police department that are expanding and growing that aren't captured here, like animal control and code enforcement uh, that, are, that we're expanding, victim services coordinators and on down the list that you can go, which would give justification to uh, the large increase in the budget, but that wouldn't necessarily have a corresponding increase in the performance metrics. So um, I thought all that was uh, very valid, which would kind of get to the uh, conclusion that I have. But those numbers um, are somewhat shocking to me. So here it is over time when you divide, and I'll go back. So what these graphs are that I'm going to show you are dividing the budget by the population or the budget by police reports, so you can get a sense of how the numbers uh, shake out over time. So the um, amount of budgeted spending per arrest uh, for KPD starting in 2016, 17, you can see how they stayed flatline. So as the population increased and the budget increased, they did so proportionally for the first three years. Uh, you'll see that sort of as a trend throughout most of the data. Uh, but then starting in 2019, 20, and then 21, uh, 22, and 23, uh, the, while the arrests did not increase, so the amount of budget that's being spent per arrest obviously is climbing. You can see the same thing from the City of Kyle's budget is spending on police per capita. So this takes that calculation is the total budget of the police divided by the population. So in the first three years, the budgeted spending per capita per person uh, stayed about the same in the mid 150s uh, as our population increased so too did the budget but they did so at a proportionate rate uh, and then in the last four years the the numbers have increased pretty dramatically to the current years uh, police budgeted spending of 284 dollars uh, per capita uh, moving on to the police report budgeted spending per police report 1500 was about the average cost if you divided the budget uh, by police report uh, in the early years. That number is now 4,000. Uh, budget spending per traffic stop is 400 to 300 in that range in the first three years, which is now $1,000 uh, per traffic stop. 
uh, the police department's budget covered by ticket revenue. So like, like I said, the ticket revenue increased at the same rate as the population, but because the budget increased at you know, about five times the population, the amount of the police budget covered by ticket revenue, uh, while it was maintaining at around 6%, uh, has now decreased to around 3%. Uh, and then the budget is spending per 911 call, which is the more, um, which is the, the, I think probably the most important statistic because it's the least susceptible uh, to um, data manipulation because 911 calls are initiated in the public. Went from $374 per 911 call to $710 per 911 call. Those are the main statistics that the performance measures sort of bear out. So as you can see, there are concerns that I think we, that I, at least I rightly have uh, about the sustainability of our approach towards policing mm -hmm. and or the importance of using these performance metrics. It mm -hmm. seems to me that it is very important <laughs> that if we are trying to provide for transparency to the public, that we provide additional data points and explanations for why these costs are changing so rapidly the way that they are. Uh, and then I also finally wanted to bring forward one other data point, uh, and that's <clears throat> as it related to budgeted spending versus overtime. And so that's this final slide. Uh, this is just the operations division, so this is comprised primarily of sworn overtime officers going over the same period of time with the, f the current years being an estimate based on five months worth of data. Uh, you can see that every year we budget roughly $75,000 for overtime for our operations division. That number did increase to $91,500 in this most current budget. But the amount that we spend on overtime per officers is increasing steadily every single year without there being any uh, budgetary um, um, analysis to provide for our transparency to show how those dollars are being spent. Uh, and so to me, that's a, a very concerning uh, statistic. The explanation for that has a lot of validity. Uh, when FTEs or when officer positions go unfilled, the budgeted amount is available to be used and is being applied. So it is not the case that we are going over the police department's budget. <clears throat> Oftentimes, I believe we come in under. Rather, it is a situation where uh, positions are being put on uh, the budget that are not being filled every single year. And those dollars are then being used to pay our existing officers uh, with overtime and that number is increasing every single year. So I think that number is troublesome as well. So I'm, I'm bringing all of this up to show that I think that the type of transparency that Proposition F is really going for uh, is as it relates to the gathering of data and would like for us to create a commission that is independent uh, and that seeks to make sense of this data and then expand the data points by a factor of 50. I would love to know what is going on with trap, neuter, vaccinate, and return because we just recently had multiple conversations about that from the dais. Uh, and there were questions about our costs and how that number, uh, that program would be implemented. And um, it, the questions were valid. It was very difficult for us to have that information readily available. And I have concern that if we go a year with the TNVR program in hand, uh, that at the end of that year, we won't necessarily have the data that we would seek to properly evaluate whether or not the program is a success. Uh, I do want to add that, in my opinion, uh, the charter language or the proposition uh, itself that went to the voters uh, <clears throat> does not reference uh, uh, use of force. It does not reference police investigations or the board being uh, a adjudicating board that takes the rights of officers and subpoenas them if there is a complaint against an officer. Uh, that is uh, one of the recommendations that the National Association of Civilian Oversight on Law Enforcement, NACOL, the big organization for these things, recommends. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, I do not think that that is an issue for us. Use of force cases in 2022, 2023, according to the racial profiling report that we received at our last council meeting was zero. Zero use of force, zero on racial profiling. And I will say that over the years, the number's not always zero. There are times when use of force is something uh, that happens. But this board, in my opinion, should not be reactionary. It should be proactive and data-driven. So I have uh, three recommendations. One is related to the formation of a committee. Uh, the second is re related to the scope of what we want the committee to do. And then the third is how we staff and fund said committee. Um, recommendation number one is that the committee should have five members. And I know there are many different ideas about it. The reason that I think five is a good number uh, is because the smaller board, as opposed to a seven member board or a nine member board or 11 member board is more collaborative and allows for more of a workshop environment as opposed to a formal larger body environment that takes lots of votes. I don't think this committee will be tasked with taking votes every time they meet, but rather will be providing feedback uh, as they develop data points to bring back to the council. Uh, second, I think that the uh, committee should operate under the boards and commissions policy generally, which is to say that we should not uh, necessarily carve out uh, an entirely new way that committee uh, board seats are filled. Um, but rather, we should look at the boards and commissions policy that we have, which means there's an application and interview process. There are terms and term limits uh, already established in the policy. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, because of the uniqueness of this board, uh, we should limit members who wish to serve from uh, serving on other boards and commissions during their tenure because it is similar, most like uh, it is most similar in its construction to the Ethics Commission. And the Ethics Commission has that provision. Uh, and then finally, that, the, that whoever serves should be a resident of Kyle and a registered voter. Uh, and then the third point uh, is that the committee should demonstrate uh, independence. Uh, and that is one of the provisions of NACOL uh, that they said is their number one, that if you're going to create an oversight committee, that it must be independent. So in my opinion, uh, we should create some number. I wrote five years. Uh, not serving in any LEO-affiliated organization. That would be CLEAT. That would also be Mono Amiga or the opposite, those who uh, take a public, visible, uh, um, structured, and organized stances for or against police or who work for police uh, organizations like the Sheriff's Department. There, could be, there should be no immediate relation uh, to any member of the Kyle Police Department by those who serve on the board. Uh, the board should, members should have demonstrated history of restraint from bias, and this would be a part of the interview process uh, for or against police. So if the uh, person applying uh, has a sort of um, um, public facing defund the police or back the blue ideology, uh, <clears throat> that would be someone we would be trying to keep off this committee so that it can maintain as much independence as possible, uh, and that they would be willing to sign an oath to uphold the aspirations of 7.06b, which if you read through it, while it does call for oversight and data and transparency, it is very aspirational in terms of what it wishes to accomplish. Uh, and I would want to make sure that the uh, committee members uh, um, adhere to that. Uh, my second recommendation would be the tasks and the limits of the board. Uh, I've got it in a primary, secondary, and tertiary, which is not one, two, and three. It's greater, uh, secondary, and then less than. Uh, the primary task of the board would be to oversee the compilation and publishing of the annual report. Uh, this is something I think that would be of immense value to the city council and to the public and would most pointedly accomplish the aspiration of section 7.06. The initial scope of the report should be prepared within the first quarter after the board is formed. So they, they, and then the scope would have to be focused on KPD and should be dri driven by localized operational and financial data, not national data or a political narrative. The scope should be presented to the council and must be approved before the committee uh, can proceed. So we would form it, uh, um, um, seat it, 
and then task it with developing an initial scope of what the uh, annual report would be. And then they would bring that scope back to us for uh, approval so that they could move forward. I think that's a very important point. So uh, the secondary task would be to oversee the quarterly uh, press briefings, newspaper publishing, and social media posts. Uh, there is clearly in the charter language an element of quarterly uh, providing some forward-facing or public-facing uh, publication. Uh, and, and once they get their bearings around the scope of the annual report, I think their secondary task should be to start to uh, implement a quarterly, um, um, a, you know, forward-facing publication uh, element. And then the, the tertiary task, the lowest of the three tasks, would be at, from the charter to make recommendations to the council regarding any changes in the standard operating policies and resource distribution strategies. Those are lifted straight from the charter. <coughs> but that they, those recommendations should be made once annually not at their whim, not at the reaction of an event, uh, and it should be memorialized in the annual report. The recommendations should be supported by local data produced in the report, so they aren't just making statements about what they want to see, but rather they are basically saying, based on the data that we have procured for you, this is how we recommend making changes. So for example, if the entire scope of the report was the data that I showed you, these are the changes that we would recommend that you make with your standard operating policies, with your resource distribution strategies, uh, with your data metrics, uh, in order to bring about a more transparent uh, uh, police department uh, and uh, a more performance-driven and community-minded police department. And then finally, that the recommendations uh, may not discuss uh, use of force policies or policies regarding investigation of KPD officers or any rights negotiated between KPD and the city from meet and confer. I think in our ordinance we initially draft, we take those items off the table so that we are unambiguous about what our intentions are and so that the, uh, the committee is also very clear in what their scope of work is and it is to be data driven uh, and to not engage in uh, use of force policies or, or anything that is in the meet and confer agreements because those are agreements negotiated between the association and the city <clears throat> once every three years. And then finally, recommendation number three is as it relates to staffing and resources. I'm recommending uh, that in order to accomplish the goals of the uh, charter uh, and that I have outlined, including in particular the development of the annual report, that we create a director slash manager position to exclusively uh, preside over this committee and oversee uh, the, uh, the direction of the committee and the council. So the manager or the director should work with members uh, of the board and they should attend, coordinate, and facilitate all committee meetings. Uh, the same independence should be demonstrated uh, as the, the committee members, meaning they can't work for a law enforcement agency, uh, they can't be associated with CLEAT or Mono Amiga or any of the uh, association type organizations. The primary background, in my opinion, of this position should be in data collection and research, not policing. The goal here is not to find someone who has been in policing for a bunch of years, but rather to find someone who is very good at sifting through information, requesting information, compiling graphs and charts uh, and data, and then manipulating that data so that it can be useful for and uh, transparent to the public. And then that director or manager should report to the city manager or an assistant city manager, not the police chief or any member of the police department in order to maintain the independence of the board in that the director should produce the annual report with the close collaboration of KPD <laughs> under the direction of the committee. I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I haven't talked this much in a while. It's so long. It's so long. Well, I've spent like 15 days working on all this and thinking about it through, so I wanted to give my uh, presentation and proposal, and I do apologize. So uh, that's, my, that's my proposal. I'm hoping we can uh, have at least something to kick off from and uh, I yield the floor. Does anybody have thoughts on all yep. of this? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I um, appreciate the presentation. 
And again, uh, I was around when this uh, this uh, Proposition A uh, F came forward, and um, we have to look at it from the reason why it was originally brought forth was just like before is to improve the communication with our police department and with our community, okay? Um, providing this information in the data reports keeps the public informed of what is going on with our police department. And it's vital and it's important on that end that we, we, we look at these reports and we look at the data so that way we can also not only see and if there, we need to correct a problem ahead of time or we can go ahead and make improvements in including when it comes to our budgets. So I wanna thank you, Mayor, for uh, the presentation because it breaks down the numbers, the financial numbers as well, to see where we're at as far as our spending and as far as our calls and our traffic and arrest and so forth. Uh, but again, I think there needs to be more as far as more reporting on that end to where we can see an, a, a bust of, of what our police department's going. So when I do break down the, um, the actual charter language itself, and for Ms. Flores Kale, I think when you had the question earlier about who had written this, uh, there was a task force that was formed back then and it was the individuals from city council members that formed the task and, and came up with the Arthur and the language on that. So to answer that question there. So when, when I look at the police department, when I look at this charter and it says the police department shall collaborate with the committee established or commissioned by the city council oversight for the operating standard procedures, timely data sharing to protect, number one, to protect all citizens and business and properties within the city. It's kind of like what we have here when we have the ordinances that we, it, we brought forth on council, such as section 2331, ordinance 1149, where, the, where we have the camping ban prohibited, okay? And then we also have the obstruction sidewalks, the aggressive uh, solicitation, so forth. That's what we see, in my opinion, what we're, we're doing to protect the citizens and business and properties and so forth. And then when I look at number two, and it says to promote the transparency within the police department to the community, including data sharing, communications, form of in-person briefing, news publications. Uh, I believe we're already doing that as well. We had the chief come up here not last meeting and did an in-person in briefing with the racial profiling report. We also have social media uh, just for a small example uh, that just came out referencing spring break and fentanyl. That's been addressed. We also have the Cobb Police Department bringing forth social media and news reports about traffic closures, especially when we have accidents. Also when we have the community shred day event. That's just another small example. And don't be an easy target campaign with lock your doors and take your keys. I think we're kind of doing that already. And number three, when it comes to reducing crime by increasing positive community engagement and promoting cooperation with citizens through education, training, and community, community policy uh, police models. How many people here have attended the Citizens Police Academy? Okay, how many people? How many people here know about the citizens on patrol? How many people know that the police department offers victim services training and volunteer opportunities? Guys, we're already doing this. We're already doing this. And it, it, it is clear today to see that we're, our police department, even though the data it seems high and low. We're already, our police department is already doing these small examples, already according to the charter right here. We're already doing it. And they're already implementing those policies and those procedures. And, and, I, and I commend them for doing that. So, um, but I understand that when this was brought forth, 
it may have sound very political. It was a, during a time I know during the very tragic incident during George Floyd. But I think as time heals all wounds, like we always say, we can be able to have this discussion and really look at if we're going to go ahead and design a committee or a commission, let's do it to where we're getting the accurate information, the data to where we can be able to move forward and be more, not only just transparent, I know we use that word a lot, but we always use the word accountability, but that's also another word for democracy, the will of the people. They want to know what's going on with our police department. We have to be able to show that form on that end. Okay. So the recommendations, Mayor, that you're bringing forth, uh, I applaud you for your effort on that. I think we do need to look at how we can go about this in a very non-political, but in a very bipartisan way to where whoever is on board or whoever is here can get a full scope and due diligence to the community, to whoever's on this board will make sure they have a full understanding that it's, that it's very important that they provide any kind of feedback that's going to not only just make to kind of see where we're at or if we're needing to make improvements, but to better our police department. Because that's what the whole key is, is we want to make sure that we support our police department in the end and the community. And if it has to do with budgets, if it has to do with data sharing, if it has to do with um, overtime, or if there's recruiting issues, we can be able to get those in a quarterly basis to where at the end of the year, we're not saying, why didn't we know about this back in March? We can be able to address these things and the, and the commission and the committee can be able to assist our police department in being able to tackle those goals. So, uh, Mayor, thank you for that presentation and uh, I'll yield the floor. Additional comments? Customer floor scale. All right, thank you. That was, I think, I was told that I would like it, so I don't know how I feel <laughs> about maybe a broken promise. But with that said, yeah. I do appreciate you doing that. I think it was very thoughtful. I mm -hmm. wish you would have got with Councilmember Tobias and I prior to, so we could have discussed it, because um, I, I was not expecting that at all. Um, so for me, the two big things that are in the ch in the charter, um, and, and as I read this, I don't read it as something that's um, as detailed as to what the mayor discussed, not that I'm in disagreement, I just don't think it's, uh, I just didn't see it that way. So for one, um, it's actually numbered one, two, three, and then there's a four. So one is to protect all citizens, businesses, and property within the city. I think that could be done maybe with reports um, for HOAs. Uh, we can get like a crime report and those can go to the <coughs> HOAs and they can figure that out as far as property and citizens. Um, I don't know what we could do about businesses, but that's something that we can talk about. Uh, the promoting transparency from PD to community, including the data sharing communications uh, in the form of, and then it was in-person briefings, uh, news publications, and social media. I think um, Council or Mayor Pro Tem Tobias said it right, like we are doing that, but how do we organize it so that's what it looks like we're doing and we're fulfilling the charter. Um, number three is reduce crime by, and this is my favorite part, um, increasing positive community engagement, uh, promoting cooperation with citizens through training, education, and community policy models. Um, and I, I like that idea in every way. Um, I think it's important that our community learn who our police officers are. Um, as I've stated before, I was not a fan of police officers growing up, and it was only when I met our police officers and I got to know them on an individual basis um, did I realize that um, there was probably some kind of um, discrimination on my behalf there. Um, the comprehensive report, I think um, we get anyways, um, but if we can have it all a little bit more structured so it looks like it feels like we're fulfilling the charter. I think that would help. I do want to touch on a few things. Um, 
I know you talked about data collection and research, hiring somebody that could do that. Unfortunately, an auditor was um, denied last time I brought it up, which would be a um, position that could do that for us, but um, obviously something I wouldn't mind bringing back. Um, I'm also a little nervous about hiring somebody specifically for this that's more like a city um, oversight as opposed to a, a committee oversight. Um, I do agree that I would like to know where our overtime is going. Um, I think we as a council are required uh, to oversee the budget and the monetary part of this. And so um, I think that was an excellent point. I didn't realize how much overtime had been paid out, but I know since we're short staffed um, that that's gonna happen. But again, that's something not everybody knows. And if we would have just seen those numbers, we would have gotten in trouble by the residents because there is no explanation there. And so I, I agree with a lot of things that you talked about. I think we could do it in a way um, that's less stringent and more community-based um, and in a more positive way um, where we're, we're looking like we're working together and not just, hey, we want to know everything that you're doing and we want um, oversight over your standard operating procedures. Um, I don't know how we get that done. I do. I will say that when I read the charter, it does not say that the city needs to draft an ordinance. It says we shall adopt. So I don't know if we want to get a committee to draft that or if we want to, um, I, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if we want them, staff, to work on that or if we want to work on that. Ultimately, it comes to us, so we approve it. Um, but I think that's important that we don't take all of this onto council and make it seem like this is our job and our duty. Our duty is only to adopt the ordinance. Um, but that could be done in, in a variety of ways. I highly encourage all of council to read the, the charter and read it and then read it when you're done, read it again to make sure that we have our own ideas of what it is we think we want this to look like. Uh, this is obviously gonna have to be brought back um, because I don't think we're gonna have a meeting of the minds during this, this meeting. Um, but I think if we all, you know, kind of get together and figure out what it is we want this to look like, we can find a happy medium. Hmm. And with that, I yield the floor. Additional discussions? discussions. I have a uh, discussion. Customer to uh, Zoom. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe Mayor and someone else should go. So, um, this was Prop F. So, the voters voted unanimously for some oversight. So I don't think there's anything wrong with um, having transparency or uh, in that we want to know the numbers. Where 14 million is a lot of money, let's just be honest. And we can all do our jobs better. And so I think that if we look at those performance metrics, there are some things that residents and the citizens would like to know is how much is spent on technology, um, equipment, um, staffing, how many hours are put into community service work, which I know our police officers do a ton of. We've got a great police department and we want to continue to support that. But just because uh, we would like a committee of oversight, that does not mean that we're not trusting our police department. We, I think that it is important to talk about transparency with uh, and to have it in a politically neutral way, but we also want that from our police department. Um, I'm, not in, I don't, I'm not comfortable when I see endorsements from our police department for candidates. I think that we're nonpartisan. We, all work, we should work as a community. Uh, we're, we're to protect and serve. So um, if we look at the trend in the budget, if we continue on that trend, we could be hypothetically in the next 10, 15 years, looking at a 20 million, $30 million police budget. And I don't think that's sustainable. So um, I think that we need to um, be realistic and say, uh, where are we spending the money? Does it make sense? We have more technology now, so why are we still spending more? If we have more technology, more, more cameras, more, more readers, it should be making it easier to um, complete um, the, the duties of, of our law enforcement, of course. Um, 
So I think that the mayor really did a very thorough analysis of looking at data points, looking at performance metrics to improve our police department um, because we can all do better, um, council included, our community included, and we wanna work collectively. So all we're asking for is the voters pass this, okay? So we can't break those promises. Otherwise, why are we building, um, why are we passing new bonds if we're not completing the, uh, the um, agreement to have some oversight. So it's not about feelings, it's not about uh, friendships here. We've gotta get past that and we just have to understand that we, we wanna know how do our programs work. I can give you some good examples, I can give you some bad examples. We've gotta look at both. There's good and the bad in everything, right? Um, Y'all do a great job, I completely see that. Y'all are helping us. I see how active y'all are. But there was, I personally made a phone call a week ago about a kid that was walking towards an elementary school. I made a phone call to Kyle PD. I never received a call back about anyone going out there to check on that kid. So that's concerning to me. So um, what we're saying is we want to know where is the communication and the transparency. Um, <coughs> I'll yield the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Councilor Parsley. Oh boy. So I, I have so many thoughts and I do appreciate your presentation. Um, I, I think that, that that might be the probably the best way to go about it. There is one section that I was not quite a fan of and it's like having a director for this oversight committee. Um, I don't know if I can you know, I'm not a fan of that. Um, five members sounds reasonable. Um, I would like to see a council member and chief be a part of that five member committee, um, something like that. Um, I hear the word transparency over and over again. I don't know that the police department has ever not been transparent and we have budgets that we can review where you can see all that information you were talking about before. Um, there is conversations about feelings and friendships, endorsements that have shouldn't be playing any anything with with this committee. This is this is not the role. We I don't even know what that's brought up into the conversation. Um, I do think that a lot of the things that this oversight committee is supposed to be doing that are stated on the charter as uh, Mayor Patan mentioned, it's things that the police department is doing already. So um, now having a committee that is there to help review and maybe engage with the community, I'm completely up for that. Maybe having a member of the eight different HOAs to communicate with the police department in regards to security and how they can, you know, patrolling, stuff like that. I agree with that. Nothing that has to do with, you know, the maybe recommendations and some things that the police department could be doing. Now, for them to be this committee that we, we still don't know who's going to be forming it, make recommendations on policies or strategies. I, I don't even know how that can play a game in here when they are the experts. Right. I mean, I have not gone through the police academy and I have not gone through the, a, a, any of the programs. So I don't, even up somebody that graduated from the Citizen Police Academy, well, except Council Member Tobias because he's into, into law enforcement, has nothing, no clue about what to offer other than just um, maybe community engagement. It's, it's something that I feel like um, we can do better. Um, this is gonna be a difficult one for sure, but I do think that there should be a city council member to be a part of this committee and, and somebody from the police department. Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> I think we've talked about it a lot. Mayor, I'd like to go ahead and uh, make a motion to go ahead 
and select a commission a committee, five individuals, five seats. Um, if anybody has any difference, I, I do um, like the name of the Kyle Police Oversight Committee or Commission. We're going to go with commission or committee. I thought committee because committee's in the charter. In the charter. So we're going to follow the, if we're going to follow the charter. But committee. We follow the boards and commissions policy. Yeah. And then the selection process shall follow the city of Kyle boards and commissions. That's my motion for these three items. Of five seats, the name, uh, Kyle Police Oversight Committee, and the selection process shall follow the Kyle City of Kyle Boards and Commissions SOP policy. That's the beginning. Police chief should be one so of those five. The motion was made uh, by Mayor Pro Tem. I'll second um, that the, w there wasn't any. There's a lot of details there to uh, be decided on, um, but uh, it has been. Is there discussion on the motion? I, I will say that I think that uh, the charter is very clear that the committee that we are forming has to have oversight over the development of the policies and procedures, which by, nece by necessity uh, means that police department cannot be on the committee that oversees the police department. And okay. so that's just I, like everything about the presentation that I made, I started with none, none of it. I started with no uh, preconceived notions about um, the background and the history. I just read it. And I read it over and over as far as exactly what it said. And then I tried to break it down and then fulfill the spirit and the letter of what the actual language says. And so while it may be the case that we don't think that the police department should have anyone overseeing them, the charter says by overwhelming majority vote, the city council shall create a committee to have oversight over the development of standard operating policies and strategies. And so what I tried to do was create a, a, a narrow, well-defined scope of what that is so that it wouldn't be outside of that well-defined scope, which is what other organizations might want to do. Uh, but we absolutely, if we are going to fulfill Proposition F, the charter must create a committee that has oversight over these things and that has uh, that fulfills these data-driven mandates. Councilman Bradshaw. I think it's going to take us a bit to really come to an agreement on exactly what we would like this committee to do. And so I'm not comfortable appointing anyone or assigning anybody to a seat on this committee until we have a clear consensus as to what they're even applying for to do. Mm -hmm. I think on my end, it's just to get the foundation of the seats, the name, and how the process would work as far as selecting. And then at, yes, if we want to bring it back as far as how we're going to go forward with the mission statement, as far as what's gonna be the requirements, yes, we can bring that back. But I think just for right now, in my view, it's getting the committee on the books and having the five seats, selecting the name, selecting the process of how these seats would be filled is, is my opinion should be the first top priority and then we can go from there. It's a step by step process. Just like kind of like the Arts and Boards Commissions, if it's a name that doesn't suit, but again, we're following the charter language and, I, and it is if what the voters had voted on. Councilor Heiser. Um, I agree with Councilmember Bradshaw's sentiment on there being a lot of unknowns right now as we're about to take a vote just on a quantity of uh, people that would serve on this committee. I have major concerns over the politicization about policing, especially coming off uh, like a six month campaign to earn the seat. I can tell you that there was no more polarizing issue that I had to talk about uh, than, than policing. 
and uh, it's unfortunate. It has led to uh, a toxic culture around policing that has significantly impacted our uh, police department's ability to hire, uh, and police departments <laughs> around the country, for that matter. Um, but what I would like to see, if if this vote that we're about to take is to to say that there will be five people on this committee is that we have a, a special workshop or, or something, some sort of meeting with council mm -hmm. to iron out the nuts and bolts and we can use um, Mayor Mitchell's, uh, and it doesn't have to be this way, but use his presentation uh, at least as a, as a starting framework for us to either to build around, uh, you know, whether we're you know, amending some of the things that are in here, but it's the most, thought out um, plan that I've seen, and no offense to anyone here, I didn't put forth anything either. So uh, I just think it would be irresponsible of us not to devote more time as a council to figure this out because we can't miss. We cannot miss on this one. If there's one thing other than you know budgeting and um, you know infrastructure, this is something we just cannot screw up. So. Yeah. Councilmember Florskill. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, the seats. I don't think five is enough um, because I feel like it's going to make it hard for a quorum. If one or two people are gone, then you don't have a quorum, and that could be an issue. So I think that's why we need more, whether it be six or seven, maybe ten. I don't know. I, I don't think we're at a point that we can necessarily um, decide that right now. Also, the name. Um, so it doesn't specify in the charter what the name has to be. So, you know, for all we wanted, we could do Kyle Police Department Oversight, Transparency, and Crime Reduction Committee, and it would hit every point in the charter. Um, so that's, again, I don't think we're, I don't think we're um, there yet. Also, as far as selecting, I think uh, that's going to be a slippery slope. I know uh, Mayor Mitchell said you did not want anybody that backed the blue, and you didn't want anybody um, that was anti-police, but how do we figure that out? And so there's a lot of things I think we need to look at, at collectively as a council and as a community. There was supposed to be an open house. I don't know if that happened. Maybe we start with that. Maybe we start all the way back at zero. People can come in, tell us what they thought they voted on, and then we can come back and, and make those choices. Because okay. it, what it sounds like right now is a whole bunch of different ideas. And then when I read the ballot and then I read the charter, that to me doesn't doesn't match either. And so what did these uh, voters think they were voting for? Well, that, that would be nice to get some feedback for that. Um, and so my, my suggestion would be to ho hold an open house, not make any votes right now, give this some real, real thought, get some community engagement. This is as important to me as a comprehensive plan mm -hmm. because this is all about the community and the police department and making sure we're all on the same page. <clears throat> in a positive way. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, sorry. I do have a motion on the table. So if it fails, it fails. I was going to amend the motion. All right. Um, you know, uh, Council Mayor Parson. Um, I would like to amend Council Mayor Pro Tem Tobias' motion and make a motion to wait until we have a city manager well established and then propose a workshop to draft this uh, committee. Second. Wait, so you're amending it by changing it to be a no. So I think maybe just the original motion just needs to be voted on and then okay. it won't be, because um, normally an amendment would be like an adding to, so. Let's just let's just um, uh, roll call vote. Uh, I'd like to make a comment. We have to. I vote. have a motion on the floor. I have a motion on the floor. Roll call vote. Mitchell. Yes. Heiser. No. No. Flores Kale. No. Bradshaw? No. Tobias? Aye. Parsley? Nay. Zuniga? Yes. All right, motion fails. Uh, three to four. Councilor Heiser. Uh, 
Well, I, it was a very big task for us to walk away with something concrete, and I still stand by what I said before that I think the, the next act, it's not that I want to say no to a five member committee, but what is the point if we don't know anything else? It's just for it, you know, the sake of, of optics that we're voting yes or, you know, potentially on just what the initial framework is for this committee. So I, I would like to, um, it's often what uh, Councilmember Parsley said on waiting for this next step to take place after we have a well-established city manager. I think we need to be doing this now because clearly we're in this position because there was not more direct action taken after it passed, you know, on the ballot. So I would think that we need to be uh, meeting as a council before we go to um, have any sort of public engagement on this. We can't go in front of the public and answer questions when we don't know what our vision is and what the potential paths forward are as a council versus individuals. And that is where politics will seep into conversation around mm -hmm. our motivations for various things yes. around. So I think that we should be meeting as a council and then d discerning what is the path forward from there? Well, can, can I make a motion to direct staff to look into this to set up a workshop so we can talk about the drafting of the oversight committee? Second. Motion by Councilmember Parsley, seconded by Councilmember Flores Kale. We direct staff to set up a workshop. Is there the discussion on the motion? Councilmember Flores Kale. Yeah, I would also like eventually, even prior to maybe, to have staff uh, hold the open house so we can understand what it is the residents want. But I get what, you, I get what he's saying. I get, I the, get it. The thing that 76% of the voters voted on, and so we can it's invite in people charter, to come in. I think they want to know how it goes. Well, I mean, to be fair, there was an open house held, or there was supposed to be. Right. I don't have any feedback on that. So why would we originally open do an open house, and then now it's a silly quest, it's a silly idea? When it's, it was the idea from the get-go. It's, it's not a city, silly idea, but I think we're completely missing the point of what our task is here as a city council. Our job is to fulfill what the voters have already told us to do by enacting the charter as written. This is not a question of what we think we should be doing with regards to the police. It's a question of what does the charter say, and we need to do our job to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. I, there, it, there was nothing in my presentation that was designed to be politically motivated. It was, it was designed to be clear, and everything about it is about fulfilling the letter and the spirit of exactly what the voters voted on and approved. And you can't say that what was presented to the voters and what's in the charter is different. It's just that you can't do that. The charter is what it is. It makes it very clear the way we're supposed to set it up, and we're missing out on lots of opportunities to create reports and get data back to us so that we can make better decisions. All right. But, but all we, we want to know is who's going to be in this committee. That's, that's what I think the part of the biggest key is going to be, is like what exactly they're going to do. You laid out really well, but who is going to be on it? Citizens. Citizen oversight. Okay, two People. things. We can get reports anytime we want. We just have to ask, A. And B, this is 10 sentences in the, in the charter, and every one of us can see it differently. So although I appreciate your take on this, it's not the same as mine. And I am a member of seven, and so I would like all of us to be heard. So it's not that we're saying you're wrong. We're just saying we see it differently. And so give us an opportunity to find a, a happy medium. Okay. And if I make a comment real quick, nowhere in here in the charter says a committee is to be established by a city manager. It says by the city council. The police department shall collaborate with, with a committee established by the city council. So bringing a city manager into this is nothing to do with what we have in the charter. It says we That's, shall collaborate. Does collaborate with to? a committee. The police department shall collaborate with a committee established by us yeah. as what we were trying to do by just establishing the committee first. Yeah, I, don't I, think under we're there, I understand that everybody has a different view and we want more town hall meetings. And I understand everybody's going to have a different. And you're right. 
Some people are going to feel like, well, I want to know who exactly is going to be on this commission. Because if they're anti-police or they're, they're pro-police, I want to know. Everybody in this room at one time has had interactions with the police department, no matter what, whether you're a kid speeding on the road or you have a domestic violence or you have whatever it is. All of us have been involved somehow or another with the police. So you, we can't say, well, I want this specific person there or I want this specific person there. These people have a right to sit on this board just like anybody else. No matter if they bleed red, blue, or whatever they come with, it's supposed to be bipartisan. And I know that's the fear. Like Ms. Ms. Kale uses, my concern and my fear. I understand that's the fear that the police have. You're going to get somebody on there that's anti-police. You're going to get somebody out there that is pro-police all the way. Flag waving and everything. But we have to trust the system. We have to trust our policy. And we have to make sure whoever comes on this committee holds true to doing the right thing. Integrity of it all. Because we're parsley. I do think citizens could be on it. What I don't want to is like end up with citizens that make recommendations and then we end up like Austin. So with that comment, I call the question. All right, the question's been called. Uh, it's non-debatable, so we'll take an initial vote. Uh, the vote is to end debate. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries six to one. Uh, and uh, so now we will take a vote on having a workshop. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. Motion carries six to one. All right, next up we're gonna bring up agenda items together, 27, 28, and 29. They are to a resolution for establishing a City of Kyle Trails Committee, uh, City of Kyle Keep Kyle Beautiful Committee, and uh, City of Kyle Community Gardens Committee. Mariana, thank you for... Mayor and Council, Mariana Espinosa, Parks and Recreation Director. The Park and Recreation Board would like to recommend the establishment of three committees under the Parks Department. They are the Keep Kyle Beautiful Committee, the Community Gardens Committee, and a Trails Committee. Uh, we have been in provisional status with the Keep Texas Beautiful uh, Affiliate Program for almost a year and a half now, and we are at the stages where we're ready to submit our final application. And one of the items we need to do so is to create a committee. Um, Park Board has made a vote that for this first committee for Keep Kyle Beautiful that the Park Board would serve as that committee, which is done um, in many Keep Texas Beautiful affiliate programs. Uh, for the community gardens, we have been working on planning community gardens now for quite some time and over the past year have made great, great progress. Um, but the Park Board feels that at this time, we need to really involve citizens in the community and what they want to see in the community garden, what's going to be planted out there, what the rules are going to be. And so the park board recommends a community gardens committee. And then for the trails task force committee, uh, we do have the 2020 bond money for trail improvements on the east, um, on the east side trails of the Plum Creek Trail. And so the Park and Recreation Board would like to see those trail improvements get completed and recommend a trails committee that is comprised of citizens, um, staff, and leadership. So uh, in line with, with the requirements of our Court of Ordinances, the attached resolutions do outline the duties of the committee, the meeting dates, and the time frame that the committees would serve. And our Park Board Chair, Amanda Stark, is here to further um, go over those details. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Amanda Stark, Chair of the Parks and Recreation Board. Um, so as uh, Mariana told you, um, the Parks Board would like to recommend um, establishing the three committees, the Trails Committee, the Keep Kyle Beautiful Committee for our scenic city, and the Community Gardens Committee. Um, so with the Trails Committee, the Park Board voted seven to zero, recommending to the City Council to form a Trails Committee that is made up of Kyle citizens city staff and city representatives. Uh, the purpose of the Trails Committee is to provide input on all trail improvements and planning duties to include providing input and recommendations regarding the City of Kyle trail systems, including the Plum Creek and Vibe Trails. 
Um, the meetings would take place March 2023 through March 2024 um, and will be comprised of 12 members. Uh, Keep Kyle Beautiful Committee. The Park Board voted 7 to 0, recommend to City Council to have the Parks Board serve as the Keep Kyle Beautiful Committee. Um, seven members on this committee. We have been working on this for quite a while and it's actually been a real honor to be a part of it. The Keep Kyle Beautiful program is the goal of the city's overall beautification efforts. The purpose of the Keep Kyle Beautiful Committee is to provide recommendations regarding the operations of the Keep Kyle Beautiful program and we will meet monthly beginning April 2023. The duties include assisting with coordinating and leading Keep Cow Beautiful events and meeting all program requirements of the Keep Texas Beautiful program. Finally, the Community Gardens Committee. Um, the Park Board voted five to zero, recommending to City Council to form a Community Gardens Committee. Uh, the Community Garden Committee to include city staff, volunteers with ex expertise in various areas of the gardens mm -hmm. and general community volunteers. Duties to include participating in meetings to provide input regarding operations of the gardens, including establishing garden rules, securing volunteers and donations, and provide input on garden design. This committee will have 12 members and will meet monthly July 2023 to July 2024. Um, we currently do have one of our board members working on grants for this, um, for this garden. Um, and like Mariana also stated, there has also been a lot of work and planning it gone into it already. It's been actually really exciting, so I'm excited to see what comes of this. Thank you. Um, so for the um, staff will work with the Parks Board on recruitment and committee member selection, and then we can bring it back to uh, council for appointment. And all of them are just for the one-year terms. All right. Thank you, Ms. Stark. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Customer Floors Cam. I just want to say I'm excited about the community garden. I remember, I mean, this has been a work in progress for even before I was excited and I was on council. So um, it's, it's pretty exciting um, to see it come to life. So thank you and thank you to the board and Mariana for, for all, all that you do for us. Absolutely. Well, and I have to say, you guys all know how I am with the community involvement and trying to get people involved. So um, getting the community in on these, um, the, on the trails and um, the community garden is super exciting. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve agenda items 27, 28, 29. Second. Second. Motion by mayor, seconded by Councilmember Zuniga. Is there discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Thank motion you. carries Thank you, seven to zero. Thank you very much. You, you want to take a break? Can I take, I can yeah, let's take a, let's take a break. We'll, um, we'll reconvene uh -huh. at 1022, 10 minutes. All right, it's 1024. I'm going to call this meeting back to order. Uh, next up is agenda item number 31, consider and possible action to approve a take-home vehicle program and related policy for the police department and to direct the interim city manager to implement the take-home vehicle program for all sworn police officers and phases as part of the future budgets of the police department. This is sponsored by Councilmember Heiser and Councilmember Parsley. Does anybody want to go first? Councilmember Heiser. Is this, uh, can everyone hear me? There was some talk about my mic not fully working. It might be user error, I don't know. Um, hey now. So uh, this to me, this agenda item, it's, it's, a, it's, a, big, uh, it's a big ask. And I just wanted to, to kind of lay out where this came from. And uh, as is, is we were talking about before, I did Citizens Police Academy and developed a relationship with, with the department in in trying to understand a lot of the challenges that they face and the way that the departments function with one another. And one of the things that we, um, that we uncovered was uh, the fact that it takes 20 candidates for them, approximately 20 candidates for them to be able to hire uh, one KPD caliber officer, which is, um, which is not a great uh, ratio for the amount of work that is put in to, and, and money that is spent trying to find these officers. It was something that came up earlier in uh, the Prop F, Prop F discussion is that there's money budgeted for these positions, but we can't fill them, which thus is leading to increase in overtime hours. So uh, the take home, uh, take home car policy 
is something that uh, a lot of surrounding police departments have adopted and it's something that based on feedback I've gotten and, uh, and various people within our department have ag agreed that uh, a take home car policy is a very, uh, is a very big motivator for uh, high caliber candidates uh, to, to apply for, for our, for positions. And so it's, I, I just felt like it was uh, something that we could look at, at trying to implement here. And uh, we've tried to be forward thinking recently with a, a $10,000 bonus, I believe for, for new hires. And that's something we can look at as well. Uh, the, you know, which is more lucrative for a, a potential officer. Is it a $10,000 bonus or is it a take home car? Uh, but <clears throat> I really would like us to, to try to, to look at how this could be implemented, the costs that the city would incur based on the growth of the KPD fleet on a yearly basis, uh, on top of what the current growth rates are uh, in terms of how many cars that we are trading in per year for newer vehicles. Uh, so my, uh, in council member Parsley's ask here was for, is for council or is for staff to, uh, to work to put together a framework for what this program could look like and the costs involved uh, so that we can uh, hopefully uh, try to create a better environment for uh, KPD to be hiring high caliber officers uh, to fill the, uh, the large quantity of open positions that they currently have. Uh, so with that, I yield to the floor. Oh, I think you said it better than I could have. I did get some feedback from residents after seeing that, that they were in pro having this approved since they considered having a police officer car in the neighborhoods would be um, to the benefit to com combat crime. Like they probably people that you know are up to no good will be hesitant to attack neighborhoods that have police officer cars. So, Councilman Bradshaw. So I. Where I grew up, it was uh, it was mandatory. Like every officer had a take home car. And when we when I moved here, I thought it was so strange that they didn't. But I will say to your point, I agree with you. It definitely does reduce crime when you see that officer's car. But most of our officers don't live in Kyle. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to, I'm open to hearing the numbers, but if we're going down this avenue, I think that there is a better way to attract the candidates that we're wanting rather than, I'm sure it's going to be a hefty price tag, rather than paying this hefty price tag for take on vehicles. Casper Zuniga. I, I agree with the, um, Ashley. Um, when I was doing a little research on it, um, there's a fuel cost and there's also a lot of commuters uh, in terms of officers in the city. So I'm not uh, opposed to it, but I would like to see more requirements into uh, you have to live within the city limits um, and maybe uh, a deduction per officer for the fuel. Um, also, who's going to carry the insurance for the vehicle? Who's going to be liable? Um, these are things we have to consider. Do we have it in the budget? Or the police budget increase, which I'm, I'm, I'm okay with, but I'd like to see it. How are we going to um, pay for it um, in, in from our city budgets? <clears throat> so for that, I, I just wanted to see more more numbers on this program. Mayor Pro Tem. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, to hit uh, both of their points, uh, it does bring an officer presence to the neighborhood. Uh, whenever you see a vehicle that is uh, driving in the street, whether they're going home, back and forth, it does bring that, um, that kind of sense of security for neighborhoods that when they see them, they know that there's somebody nearby. Uh, the question I have, and maybe uh, Chief, if you wouldn't mind answering this one, it says that in Section 3, the assignment and use of department take-home vehicles, eligibility, 
Police officers of any rank who reside within the city limits or within 10, but it's slashed out now to 20 mile radius of the city, uh, city limits are eligible for consideration. Uh, police officers living outside of the 20 mile radius may be considered for the take home. Do we know why that was changed from 10 to 20? I and do, also, sir. Okay. Yes, uh, Jeff Barnett, Chief of Police for the record. Uh, thank you, sir. So 10 miles has been the uh, city manager's approved limit since uh, since I became uh, police chief here, so 2011. So that number has existed at the city manager level for a lengthy number of years. Um, we would like to change that to 20 uh, for consideration. The policy that has been in effect, um, you can see there, I think that's a 2017 if I'm not mistaken, but nonetheless, the 10-mile designation is set by the city manager I believe for all city departments, not just the police department. And 20 mile is what we would like to go to, being that this point is up for discussion now. Okay, so across the board, whether it's um, the engineering department or public works or somebody that has their take home supervisor vehicle. So across the board, city policy has a 20 mile radius that includes uh, the officers as well city managers direction is okay. 10 miles and nothing more unless you have very specific approval and an example of when special uh, Approval has been given is our three police motor units live beyond the 10 mile limit to the city limits okay. But since we do not provide a garage or a safe place to keep that motorcycle out of the weather They were granted special authority to exceed the 10 mile city manager authorized limits So they take those to and from their house and they live beyond the 10 mile limit Okay, so with this amendment, we're also asking to change it from the 10 to 20, is that as correct? That is a direction I would like to go, is to 20 miles for the police department policy, how that impacts other city departments, and the scope that the city manager could extend that uh, would certainly be up to him, but our ask would be to allow police officers to utilize a 20 mile limit. Okay, and um, I know we may have mentioned before, you and I <clears throat> had a conversation about about your fleet uh, officer or maybe an MVO, motor vehicle officer, uh, in the future. Um, there'd be regular, so basically the officer that is, takes this or the sergeant or corporal, whoever's taking this take home vehicle, uh, obviously they'll be responsible for the upkeep and the cleanliness and so forth, making sure it has the fuel uh, uh, gauge all the way up, you know, you're not running low and empty. I know we had one car that actually was. Um, but they will be fully responsible for the maintenance itself. How would they be able to, I guess, coordinate with the fleet officer or the fleet versus like normal maintenance that would be there at the station? So we have, we don't, ha we don't have a fleet officer yet. You'll see me bring that forward in this year's budget consideration because the number of vehicles that are assigned to the police department is certainly growing each year. Uh, we do have an officer that is assigned to that duty amongst many other duties, so he wears many hats. Um, but that officer would then coordinate with that part-time person and schedule the appropriate maintenance or oil change or tire change or whatever that may be at the approved facilities that we have here in the city and then follow that, uh, that officer's direction on what vehicle to take for the day or two while your vehicle is out for routine maintenance. They wouldn't necessarily uh, be solely responsible for maintenance because we want to keep consistency in our program and we don't necessarily want officers choosing where to go and exactly when they're gonna drop vehicles off. There needs to be some coordination so that we have replacement vehicles for them to use for the day. But they would coordinate with the appropriate person, take it to the appropriate facility, and to answer your question about general maintenance, general upkeep of the vehicle, that would absolutely be part of their responsibility, yes. That's all I have. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate yes, it. You bet. Customer floor scale. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so for me, it's going to be either or. Um, and when I say that, I mean it's not going to be $10,000 and a car. So I think as a city, we need to figure out where we want to go with this incentive. Um, and to help me figure that out, I just have a few questions. Um, so how many officers do you need to hire to be fully employed or staffed? 14 as of today. Okay, how many hiring bonuses have you paid? Zero. Okay, how much money do you have allocated for hiring bonuses? Zero. It's a salary, we were given permission to use salary savings, so we know that it obviously takes a period of months to sometimes hire officers. During that period, there are savings in the salary because no one is in that position. 
we were given permission to only to use the salary savings, meaning money we already have in our budget, to offer those bonuses throughout the year. And obviously, since we've uh, offered zero, because remember, this is for lateral entry police officers that are already certified. So, so far, we have not had a lateral entry qualified officer eligible to receive the up to $10,000 entry or bonus pay. So how much do you have in salaried savings? Um, I can do some quick math. We've got about, we're about five months into the year, and I just told you we had 14 openings, so we would divide an officer's salary um, by those 12 months and multiply it times the remaining. So uh, I haven't done the math on it, but you're talking um, probably close to $100,000 just off the top of my head, and that is very, very quick math, so I apologize. All right. I won't, I won't hold you to that. Um, so how many vehicles will the city need to purchase? I'm going to rely on Lieutenant Griffith or Commander Griffith to give me some of those numbers because he's been studying those along with Sergeant Gooding. So it depends on if the answer is for today or if your answer is for the full intended authorized strength, meaning counting all the openings that we have and such. So I'll let him give you some numbers if that's okay because he's, he's more refreshed on it. Alex? Tim Griffith, Commander of the Police Department, for the record. And your question was how many vehicles do we need to buy like I say, tomorrow we had, we implemented a take-home car tomorrow. We would need 13 more cars for a take-home car program. If we were to implement this for the long term, for our entire of our current sworn strength, it would be 29. Okay. And do any of the surrounding cities have the take-home program? Yes. Uh, the cities around us also have, so Hayes County Sheriff's Office, San Marcos Police Department, New Braunfels, those, those agencies around us do that. And would you be willing to, or you or Chief, be willing to give up the $10,000 hiring bonus and reallocate that to the cars? So the first answer is we'll do absolutely what council wants. Uh, I would say that there are really two different goals in the immediate future with these options. Number one, the $10,000 bonus is generally offered to entice lateral entry transfer police officers to want to come to work at Kyle PD and to help ease the transition of the move, the moving expenses to maybe relocate if they don't already live close enough to just daily commute. So that has an immediate impact. If you were to tell us today that you wanted us to implement the 13 cars or the 19 cars or the 29 cars, uh, because of the supply chain, we're probably 18 to 24 months out before we can even receive that number of cars. So the benefit that you would be asking a candidate to consider, a take-home car in the future, could be two to three years down the road. The $10,000 is just to help ease their effort to get to Kyle and come to work at Kyle, whether that's a moving company or closing costs or renting a new apartment and establishing yourself at a new location. That's the benefit of that $10,000. And remember, that is paid out in three payments. They don't get $10,000 on the day they start. They get approximately one-third of that up on hire, they get the second third approximately when they complete the field training program, and the final third when they complete one year of employment. So uh, I don't know that they're good equal opportunities to say you no longer get the 10,000 because you're going to get a take-home car, because our this plan that's being discussed <laughs> is to go offer all police officers that would come to work here, even the ones that are not lateral entry, but the new non-certified applicant and when they graduate the academy and the FTO program they would be given a car so you're almost you're cheating the ones who are already state certified and you're taking away a benefit from them and that's who we want because we avoid the cost and the time delay of the police academy which is approximately seven to eight months now you're getting experience that takes years to obtain out there on the street so I'm not really sure that they're equal contributions and remember if you take the ten thousand dollars away the sign-on bonus that's not a budgeted amount of money that, that council has given us. That is actually the salary savings, so it's kind of hard to take it away, if that makes sense. I hope I answered that. You answered it. I'm just trying to figure out a strategic way financially to kind of even out the, the, the ball field, if you know what I mean. Because um, I, I would like to see some incentives that actually work. And so if you're telling me that you and, – and there is a pot of money. It's – you know, the salary savings, is that what it's called? Yes, ma'am. Um, so th it's a little bit. Now, what we do with it, I think, um, is really up to the police department. And I just find it really difficult to give both 
Um, considering um, we're limited on funds. Yeah, I think it's strictly to to attract those that are already qualified. It's really the, the money and effort and time that you're saving from them going to the academy. That's really the savings that that counteracts because if we pay the salary of an, a non-sworn applicant, the salary plus their academy training fee that we pay, plus everything necessary to get them through the police academy for six to seven months, uh, there's an expense in that. And if we can avoid that cost and that expenditure of money while they are attending training, uh, we are far better off. That 10,000 is a mere drop in the bucket compared to what we pay over that eight month period while they're in academy. That's the savings for the city. And that's why we had requested and you approved the opportunity to give them 10,000 instead of spending perhaps 50,000. It's to avoid that cost and experience, expense and time delay before the citizens realize an officer out on patrol after graduation of the training program. I would like to see, is there any way you can send me those numbers, a breakdown of like what that would cost versus, you know, we just hiring somebody who's sworn and paying them the bonus. Sure, I would be like the savings in the, their salary for the eight yeah, months, like, their costs. It, yeah. Sure, absolutely, we can do that. Okay. Councilmember Zuniga. So <coughs> just, just because of the numbers, so if that would mean 17 new vehicles and for all the officers, that's 52 officers to have a vehicle. Is, am I right? I mean, I'm, and again, then I'm we're I'm So, sure you're right, but it, we want, there's 52 officers, we want them all to have a vehicle. So, but we need 17 more, right? 13. 13, okay, so 13 new vehicles. So we're gonna have 52 of them and we're gonna move the radius to 20 miles. So are we, I think this is, this is starting to look like half a million dollar budget increase. Am I right? So, something like that to fund it. And this is every year. And you would also see the increase in vehicles required for that program over the years to come. So that number would only increase. So I don't want to mm -hmm. misspeak about the number that you just yeah. quoted, right. but I can say whatever number is correct would increase okay. annually to achieve a full, we have 77 right. sworn positions in the department total. So, I mean, so, so if, it would work its way towards that right. number. So if we took the cost now of the vehicles being used to take home and the ones not, not, not taken home, and we just add up a few more to get the 52, and the cost would actually go up because now we're going 20 miles. That's both ways. It could, absolutely. 20 miles to get here, 20 miles back. That is absolutely so part of the consideration. I'm just concerned from the taxpayer uh, money on Absolutely. That but I think it's a great program. I great completely insane. understand the, the concern about, and the question that you raised, absolutely. I don't disagree at all. Councilmember Heiser. Uh, Chief, how, uh, how many new officers have been hired so far this year? Um, uh, this fiscal year, approximately four or five. So approximately four. given that we gave a job offer today and he accepted so uh, in the neighborhood of five ish since October the 1st and how many um, how many I keep forgetting the term like how many tr uh, open tryouts have we had for uh, um, so had in recent weeks? times I believe our last test was in September with the exception of one that was offered about about three weeks ago so, so we generally offer a test about every four to six months uh, depending on how long it takes us to get through the backgrounds. The officer that does most of the backgrounds is James Plant. You see him here most of the time because he does the community outreach programs, except when he's doing backgrounds. So he's another person that wears multiple hats. So it depends on how long it takes us to get through the background process to where we are running out of candidates, and then we establish the next test. I believe, without this being final, that the next expected test is probably in early May. So every three to five months or so, we have been in the active uh, testing process. So is it fair to say that we'll probably do two more uh, open testings? At least, yeah. At the end of the year? Yes, sir, at least, okay. probably three or so. Okay, and then, it, so given how the difficulties of hiring and, and just the data that you've provided, it looks like we're, I mean, at least, at least a year away from being able to fill those 14 positions, just to fill. And then on top of that, the training and onboarding, which you said is around eight months now. So in terms of the growth of the fleet, 
you know, we have, this is gonna be a phased out plan is, is what m my vision for this is going to be because we don't need the cars today. We, we need, it, and given the supply chain difficulties that we've experienced and how long it takes to get cars, this isn't something that's gonna be like a lump sum amount of money that's gonna come out of our budget or come out of, you know, or that'll be added to budget or reappropriated. So um, thank you very much. Yes, sir. I, I just wanna say that, you know, I think that's dangerous, uh, a dangerous way to think. Uh, I think Councilor Mazunga is probably on the low end as far as the total budgetary impact. You have to think in terms of years, not in terms of months, but five officers in five, in five months is one new officer. That's, you know, and if a vehicle's fully equipped is, you know, I know we lease it, but the present value of a vehicle is what? But plus the equipment or that including the equipment. So that's, that's you know, $400,000 in five months that if we, those five new, new officers uh, were to receive vehicles. Uh, and then you add that to 29 uh, new people coming in. The budgetary impact is substantial. And I've been studying the budgets. Like this is just, for me, it's like this is a year where we've given historic raises to our police departments. They're getting a 64,000 with 44,000 available to them on day one. Brand new state-of-the-art uh, um, uh, uh, facility to operate out of. Those are all plus a $10,000 bonus. So major increases in pay major increases in digs in terms of their facility uh, and, uh, and then increases in compensation uh, plus obviously the operational officers those officers are getting a uh, substantial uh, annual overtime amount as well it's like in my mind it's like can we we need to take a break and see if all of these things coming together will have a positive impact because as of right now we are no longer behind in the region as far as you know what we were offering our officers as a as a whole package I mean, that's in the numbers. It's in the data. If you just would just look at it, it's there. Uh, so I just, I'm just asking us to consider at least having some kind of financial restraint about how we're moving forward because these, these decisions have consequences on our ability to make future decisions because the money just isn't freely flowing as much as we may feel like it is uh, at this time. And then the other thing is as it relates to the budgeting process between it, this is a very similar concept. So that when it comes to the police, we, we have all of these FTEs uh, that we have budgeted and funded knowing that we're not going to fill them and there's going to be savings. And then we're taking that savings and using them in ways that aren't budgeted, like way more overtime than is being proposed. Those kind of, those kind of situations make it difficult to know just how much money we're actually spending uh, on our current officers and, and moving forward. And so I'm just... I'm just personally, I could see doing, if we had some savings to do take home vehicles, um, but I do not think that we should look at salary savings from budgeted officers as a slush fund to use however we see fit. And in particular, to shoehorn in other budgeted items that then will ratchet up. It's how, it's how the, uh, the budget gets ratcheted up. It's through these mechanics. Uh, that's what increases the, uh, the budget. So substantially and has done so substantially in the last two or three years uh, in, in particular. So it's, it's just a situation if we, were going to, uh, if we were going to be honest about how we were budgeting, we would create the FTEs, but we would not fund them until they are filled and we can backfill and very easily balance that out so that there are not all of these budget savings that can be reappropriated to other unbudgeted um, unpublic facing uh, items. So I just wish we could do that. Councilmember Bradshaw. Chief, do you feel like this is the best option when it comes to incentivizing new candidates? So I do under these very specific examples. So I think where this conversation was initiated was I think our officers, our recruiting officers were very specifically asked are we competitive with our nearby cities and other agencies for which we compete with employees? And I think the answer was we're very competitive. Our salaries come a long way. Our benefits are good. Our new police facility is going to be magnificent. Is there any area in which we're not competitive? And the area was the take-home car. I think it was as simple as that. I think that's kind of how this conversation was, was moved forward. 
So we have candidates that are considering applying with the city of Kyle that also are considering other agencies. And when they are given the recruiting spill about this is our salary, our benefits, our wages, our culture, the great support from council and citizens, when you get down to, well, what's the difference between your agency and XYZ agency in the region? Really the only answer right now is the take home car. And I think that as we are recruiting in very challenging times, we can all admit that uh, law enforcement across the country is, is heavily engaged in recruiting and everyone, including every state and local office is offering a number of benefits that we thought we would never see in our career. This is the one area where there was a notable difference. And I think that's what brought this conversation forward is, is this an area that we, meaning city council, want to be more competitive? Do I think this would solve probably the last missing piece of competitiveness? I do. We certainly understand all the, the financial component of that as well, but just to give you an idea where this came from, I think that's it. Okay, um, I would like to make a motion to direct staff to bring back, let's go with three different phasing options for take home vehicles for officers within a 10 mile radius of the city. I don't think that we should extend it to 20 miles because at the end of the day, we're paying to keep our city safe, not other cities safe. And also chief, if you can send what Councilmember Flores Kale had asked uh, about the training savings for uh, in comparison to what the cost of the take home vehicle would be. Yes, sir. We can do that. Thanks. Second. Absolutely. All right. Motion by Councilmember Bradshaw, second by Councilmember Flores Kale, that we bring back three different phasing options for the take home vehicle program uh, for a 10 mile radius. With some with some stipulations on fuel insurance as well. Can I yeah, ask? That's what, not in the yeah. Can I ask? Not in the motion. So <laughs> second by Councilmember Flores Kale. There's discussion on the motion. Councilmember Flores Kale. Yeah, I, I would actually like to um, see if I can amend it to include any benefits of this program, um, maybe a savings long term, um, instead of going with uh, you know the five officers using the same car. Um, I don't know what the resale looks like, but I think um, anything that would help um, kind of explain why we should do this program, I think that would be beneficial. So I don't know if. Um, if Councilmember Bradshaw is okay with amending it to include any benefits or uh, paybacks that you would receive uh, in selling the cars or in, in a resale, I think that would be important as well. They're leased, so we don't resell them. No, but when we when we buy them, they would be ours, right? Or no, they're leased through an enterprise program. So. The only similar answer to what your question is is there is a certain uh, value that comes back to us through the leasing company. When values are when vehicles are traded back in at the end of the lease program, it has a certain value and that can be rolled into the city's overall lease program. So the better shape, less mileage, uh, newer variety of car that's turned back in obviously has a higher value than an older car with more miles and, and whatnot. So that would already be realized at the end of the lease program that we currently utilize in the city department wide. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Customer Heiser. Just one quick question, Pervez, do we pay for the cars upon order or delivery? Delivery. All right, thank you. Any further discussion? So are we just getting numbers or are we yes. saying, yes, we're gonna do this program in phases? Numbers. 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 <clears throat> okay. okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. All right, motion carries, 7-0. Next. Next up, agenda item 32, considering possible action to bring back the Citizen and Volunteer of the Year Award for the City of Kyle. Councilmember Zuniga. Oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. <laughs> it's been a difficult night. So uh, this uh, item, because I think that it's important to acknowledge uh, our volunteers and the uh, residents that um, do great work for our community. Um, and maybe we should start looking at creating a little trophy and um, have nominations for the citizen of the year or the volunteer of the year because the, this is a way to show our gratitude for the great work, for the community work of uh, residents that are doing this every day. But if we have something that really acknowledges the effort from our community, um, this is something that adds to our city, 
and um, we, we, need to, we need to find a way to um, um, congratulate that. So was council be interested in creating an award? Gets me a small, small plaque. Councilmember yes, Parsley. I just have a quick question. So I do appreciate all volunteers. When you said bring back, is it because there was a program before or do you want to implement something? I, I want to implement something. I don't know if okay. there ever was a program. Okay. Because I asked staff and they said that they didn't know about it. So are you talking about volunteers that help within the city programs? Just the city of Kyle programs? Just city of Kyle. Okay. So I don't know if, if, if maybe doing a volunteer week um, event or a volunteer weekend event, I think naming just one volunteer or proposed volunteer, I mean, I don't know if you wanted to do one volunteer. Well, well the, the way I was thinking at it is, is a, a person who's doing a lot of work could use it on a resume and they could use it trying to get into a college, something that says uh, I was the citizen of the year for Kyle, maybe I, did a lot of street cleanups, and he, that person was nominated. It's in, it's a it's a. I don't I don't see what the issue is. Just create a little. No, it, there is no issue. I'm just trying to understand what you're really trying to do. Because sometimes, I mean, volunteer, and I feel like the real volunteers are are not to be like see like we will know who they really are. Most people that volunteer for the right reasons don't seek any appreciation. Um, or any trophies or anything like that. That's the way I see it. I, I do know a lot of people that like to volunteer just to, for the sake of taking pictures and share where they are. But So I do think that maybe we can have a volunteer appreciation event for all the volunteers that help within the city of Kyle. I, I think that will be a good idea. I mean, I've also seen where they do like a monthly volunteer of the month for the city. But I was actually at a chamber converse, a, a chamber gala, and that city took a lot of pride in recognizing individuals who went above and beyond and helped their community. And they found those people. So, and there was nothing wrong with uh, getting a clap and getting a pat on the back and saying, um, you did a great job and this is something that will be a lasting memory for you. So are you talking about the Buda Chamber yes, of Commerce? Yes, I thought that, that so. actually, creates a, a unity cohesion in your city. Well, I, so it's an honor, it's an award, it's an honor. Are you wanting to maybe encourage our Chamber of Commerce to be to add more of those yes, programs? Yes, let's add something like that. I, I like the chamber sort of handling it as opposed to, right. yeah. especially this body, I, you know, that can be kind of tough because when, when you're talking about seven individuals up here maybe voting on it or something like that, it just can become become very political when you right. start doing it from the city standpoint, but the chamber t t can yep. uh, typically do that a lot better. But I don't know if you've talked to, did you, have you spoken to our chamber about it yet? I did not, but I think they would be the good place to have it. And I think they used to do it, but somehow right. it, caught, fall, it kind of fell through the cracks. And so we've got a gap to fill and we need to fill this gap. Mayor Pro Tem. I think also the, uh, wasn't it also the Hayes Street Press or somebody does that? They do a yearly, mm -hmm. um, you know, volunteer of the year education, volunteer of the year business. I know my wife won it one year when she was um, volunteering at the schools and being on the school board. Because, But then again, to Ms. Parsi's point, um, we have hundreds of volunteers. Um, Ms. Amanda Stark that was here is a volunteer for the Parks Board. We have Mr. Guerra, who's a volunteer for the commissions for planning and zoning. We have lots of volunteers that help out during the Easter egg hunt. Uh, even high school students that come out, we're gonna have the kayak. Um, so uh, I, see, I see your point where you wanna be able to recognize an individual who goes above and beyond. I, I, I just feel that we have so many in this city that do that already. Um, and as far as the resume, putting it on there that they're volunteer of the year, uh, again, I, I think each one of these individuals that are volunteers can use that on their resume of what they do in the different areas. Um, uh, I guess I will, a suggestion, yeah, as what the mayor brought up, is to get with uh, the Chamber of Commerce to see if they do anything like that. 
and see if the city is interested in partnering up with them in that sense. Uh, but you're right, narrowing it down to one person to say this one person went way above beyond this other person and this other person, uh, it, it could be to where it's like, well, I've been doing this for 20 years and that person's only been doing it for two years and they only show for one meeting and then they can get the award. So we want to make sure if we're going to do something like this, we, we, we reach out to other, other, other avenues on, on that end is, is what I would say on that. Yeah, I don't think we have to always look at it as a negative. We can be positive about it and find, um, I'm sure there's really good ways to screen um, the, not, the amount of hours and work and energy that a person put in their community. Councilmember Heiser. I'd like to call for a motion to authorize Council Member Zuniga to represent council in working with the Kyle Chamber of Commerce to create a uh, Volunteer of the Year Award. Okay. Motion by Council Member Heiser, seconded by Council Member Flores Kale, uh, that we authorize Council Member Zuniga to work with the Chamber to create a C Citizen of the Year and Volunteer of the Year Award. Uh, is there discussion on the motion? Um, I don't know how well they're going to receive that. Council, council gave action and sent me to go tell you to make a citizen of the year and volunteer of the year. Exactly. I'm here representing the city. I don't know. I'm just. They, yeah, it, they, well, what? if they want to do it, then. right? It's, but they yeah, don't have to do it. Not yeah. They, they the give out small business of the year, medium business of the year, yes. large business of the year. They do give out awards every year, so um, they may not like the. I don't want to put you in a weird right. spot where you come in. With if that they sort say of, no, then that's fine. Yeah, there's no harm. No harm. Well, I don't think there should be any direction. I'm like, Council Member Suniga can yeah. speak directly to the chamber and say, hey, are you guys interested in this? And then... Yeah, my well, thought was just go talk to them and get feedback right. that, you know, as opposed to the, the action might seem a little bit strange, but, in my opinion. So. But I don't want to speak for Council, so that's why I'm here right. to be transparent. No, I, it's, it's, a, it's a good idea. It's just one of those things where, you know... A, well, I'm completely comfortable with him speaking on our behalf No one here wants to vote no, I'm sure, to say we don't want to recognize volunteers. So I think there's this a lot is, of things people don't want to vote no well, to. Well, it's been so. a long night. So right. the two, two key words are work with. Those are not heavy handed words. Those are, you know, as, as Council Member Zuniga said, That's if they say right. no, they say no. And Any I further think discussion? That this is on video so they can see that we do not have ill intent here. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries, seven to zero. All right, next up, agenda item 33, considering possible action to increase urban tree canopy green infrastructure throughout the city of Kyle. Councilmember Zuniga. Oh my gosh, I'm so nervous up here. So I'm gonna need five minutes on this one because um, to get to what I wanna ask, we have to know a little bit of the history and the research on this. So, um, When we uh, think of green infrastructure, it is really like a principle and idea that complements what we already have in gray infrastructure, which is our wastewater storm drainage management. And so currently when we think about water, anything that hits impermeable surface goes down our storm drains. And that has an impact because it carries a lot of pollutants, uh, the water's not clean, goes into our uh, creeks and lakes. Um, does, it's not allowed to filter down, doesn't recharge. So green infrastructure is complementary so, to a lot of this gray new development. And what it is is um, an attempt to try to beautify the city, clean up the, the air, clean up the water, and really look at water as a resource, not just something that rains and it's washed down. So. Um, a lot of cities have taken green infrastructure approaches in which they've put little flower beds, they've put plant boxes, they've put planters, they've put um, cuts inside curbs that allow the water to go in there and kind of sit and infiltrate. They've looked at developments and they've said, okay, don't compound the soil, add maybe a foot of um, 
um, good soil, so then they put your turf on top of it, and all of that helps because it, it absorbs water. So this reduces a lot of flooding, and then with the greenery, of course, um, it reduces all of these heat zones throughout the city, and it um, improves the quality of life, and it's better for the environment. So when I went and worked on the um, uh, Great River cleanup, I noticed, and after I actually read the Plum Creek Watershed Report, that the creek is impaired. And the creek is impaired because there's all of this stuff works together. So the runoff from the water hitting all this impermeable streets and zones running into our wastewater management, it's sort of inadequate. It puts pressure on the integrity of the system. And we end up with all this polluted stuff in our creeks. And um, obviously, there was a lot of plastic down there and other things down there. So this is really making it hard for the wildlife to survive. So green infrastructure is uh, using these new principles of the flower beds, recollecting your water. And I mentioned this earlier when we talked about the public safety center. I was surprised <coughs> that we didn't really think about how to we um, add collecting ducts that maybe can reuse that water to uh, reclaim it and reuse it. And that would have been a good example of taking a pilot program kind of project and implementing it because in order to have the great city and the beautiful city that we all want, we have to work for it. it means we have to invest into it. And so we have got to take this green stuff and incorporate it. And one simple small scale approach that we can look at now is how do we add more green canopies? These things actually um, contribute to mental health, to um, people who, who want to relax, they can come outside. If we had green canopies in, in, in a few of our parks, um, that would be a real benefit and a real investment that would beautify our city. So green canopies is just a small scale. So in order to get that done, what I was proposing is, what if we looked at a voucher program? We currently don't give the residents of Kyle really much of an incentive to, to go out and plant anything in our city. So I've looked at what, do, what are some of the other cities doing, and uh, they've implemented programs that give a resident of the city a $20 voucher up to, that they can go and buy a tree and plant it, and they limit it to 200 vouchers, one time per, one per household. So I was thinking, um, how do we do this? How, do we be, how, do, how, how are we going to be proactive? because we have to start, we have to start doing some of this. And thinking of the natural hydrology of how does the green infrastructure help with our current gray infrastructure. So those are my thoughts. And if people aren't interested, that's fine, but I think that I care about some of these environmental things to um, do something about it. Thoughts, discussion? I will say that the Public Safety Center, I, did, I can get with Jerry or Chief um, or AGCM. You should look at the low impact designs that were put into it, the landscaping plan. Low impact, mm -hmm. We have low impact designs, uh, LID, LID uh, designs in the facility, uh, and a great deal of landscaping put in for, uh, for what it's worth. Um, do you have any sense of what the cost would be for a program like 200 that? 200 vouchers, $20 a voucher, $4,000 one year. 20 that, as a tree, as a tree. $20. That's your voucher. You got to go make, pay the difference. But a tree is a tree $1,500 is, a, for a three inch a, caliper tree. Right. So, up, so the, the resident can use the voucher to just go buy a tree, right? Obviously the trees can range in cost. But if you go look at the small, bu the small um, bucket ones, the $20, $30 gallon ones, they, they only run about $200. Go yeah. to your HEB. I bought, I've bought a few, but not every resident can afford $260 to go plant a tree this year. So we incentivize them. We give them $20. They go use it. They pay the difference. Um, it's a small program. I don't think it's going to hurt us, and it actually beautifies the city. Uh, well, the only thing I would say is that th these kind of proposals are really good for the budget season, and but but I'm actually not going to 
try to hold you to that because we've already made multiple right. mid mid year un unbudgeted um, expenses. So I don't I don't I don't know exactly what the impact is that you're. I understand what the impact is that you're trying to make, but I think it's just going to be kind of well. The other challenging thing to, to measure that is because through these developments over these last ten years, I think that we've lost a lot more forestry than we've replaced. So this is a way to mm. make up those make up those numbers. So I don't think we're replacing one to one. We go through these large anchor developments. We we chop down 200 of them. We get 10 back, 10, 20 back. So this is a way to um, let's put back into the soil what was cut down. Let's help it out a bit. Customer Bradshaw. Okay, so I hear what you're saying, and I think we all love the earth and the environment. And I agree that we have definitely chopped down our fair share of trees mm -hmm. with all of the new development. However, I think that if we were to implement something like this, there should be a way for us to put it back on the developer. And I, ha I actually have an item that I'm proposing for the next agenda where we can incorporate some sort of landscaping ish type, um, I don't want to say requirements, but preferences to help implement exactly what you're trying to do without having to pay out of pocket on our end to do it. Just just an idea, if you would be open to that. Otherwise, I, yeah, I agree with uh, Mayor Mitchell. Let's talk about this at budget season. Councilman Flores Cal. Um, I remember a Facebook post with a lot of angry people who saw their trees getting cut. So I can kind of understand where Council Member Zuniga is going with this. Um, as far as new development, I think that's a great idea. But unfortunately, there's a lot of development already within the city of Kyle. Um, and I think it would be um, a cute idea to, again, talk about during um, the the uh, budget to see how we can allot some money, um, $20, $25. I myself have bought that uh, apple tree at HEB for like 30 bucks. So um, I think it's a good idea. I think it would incentivize in addition to whatever Council Member Bradshaw brings. Um, that makes me excited. Um, but it's nothing that I'm opposed to. I, I, I just agree with Mayor Mitchell. It's like maybe we should just wait until the budget. So the budget is May, right? So really start. the month of growth is March and April. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of because of the season. That's, that was my only thing. May pro tem. All right, thank you. Yeah, great idea. I understand where you're getting at uh, about the trees and, and, and the infrastructure and so forth on that end. Um, yes, we've had a lot of development come in. They've cut down a lot of the trees and um, some of them are being planted in front of the homes and so forth. Um, budget season would be a good time to talk about it. I, I know you're, you, you, want to, you want this, uh, I guess right now is the season, but we have to see where our money's at. But at the same time, if you look at agenda item number 29, resolution for establishing a community garden, that could also be something that we could partner up with as far as them growing the trees and then we can go from there. Work on developing a program to where we could get seeds of the trees or brush or whatever it is that we're trying to regrowth. We can utilize this new garden in the future um, to work on getting with whatever we're looking at as far as the, the city. We can also work with Mariana and her group to see where they're looking at as far as uh, planting new trees in the parks and so forth. Because so I think that's kind of, we would also have to narrow down what, where are we wanting to plant these trees? Is it in, in people's homes? Is it on the side of the road? Is it in the parks? Is it in the city area? Exactly like uh, Mayor uh, had brought up. I know when you went there to the public safety center, you didn't see any greenery because nope. it's under construction right now. It's 
you've got cement, you've got trucks, you've got boards, you've got that. But looking at the final plans, he is correct. There is going to be some green space there with trees and shrubbery and so forth in the future once it's all completed. Um, so great idea. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm all about the trees. I, I got kind of fussy when they started cutting it down over there by Roland Lane. Um, but it, it, I guess we just look at where we at our dollars, look at how we can team up with maybe this new committee that was just formed for the gardens, get with the parks department to see what plans they have moving forward with any new vegetation and plants. And also with what, what uh, Council Member Bradshaw says, when developers come in, this is one of the requirements that we're going to want you to have. We want this amount of trees in the area. We want this amount of shrubbery in the area as well. And you, what kind of water recycling are we going to be using or can you use as, as you know, we just got that wastewater uh, re rezoning fund we got in the other day. So it's just looking at those kind of different options and going from there. So we have a we have a landscaping ordinance that would be good to familiarize yourself with because it spells out um, if a developer comes in and they they're cutting out trees how many they have to replace and how it has to look. I developed here, so I dealt with it. Uh, what caliper they have to be, what types they have to be. Um, the, you might find that, uh, and Will can probably speak to it, but you might find that uh, we already have pretty robust. Uh, plans or rules in place about tree planting for new development, but that said, it can always be improved. Uh, right, so, so. The the original landscaping ordinance that back in 2014, when I was uh, a, a building a dealership here, was so onerous as far as trees that had to be planted. It was like I had to plant an orchard uh, in front of my dealership, and I'm not kidding you. It was it was insane. It almost didn't work. So I had to get a variance because the rules. So you have to make rules that work. Is my point, and that's just from the years, and so they, they actually changed the landscaping ordinance again. The original was that you had to have four inch caliper trees. Those are $2,500 trees eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, those, and then it, when you put in trees that are that large, it doesn't, um, they don't survive as well because they're too big to be transplanted. And so two inch caliper trees are actually better and cheaper and they will o overtake a four inch caliper tree uh, in girth uh, eventually, so. That landscaping ordinance would be good. Maybe, Will, if you want to uh, email, you don't have to get up. I'm just going to say email it to us. That way we can peruse it as we're having this discussion. Uh, so, Will, with the um, landscaping ordinance, because I looked over at Cool Springs Lenar, um, I noticed that when they put in the turf, there I did not see any topsoil there. They just compacted it through the, through the sod in there. And that was it. So does our landscaping ordinance call for more of a bed layer of topsoil that's not compacted before the turf is put on? Because if you're compacting it, you're just basically causing more runoff. So how is our code ordinance good enough for this type of um, green infrastructure improvements? That. Will Atkinson, uh, Director of Planning for the Record. I don't know the answer that, to that specific question for um, appropriate uh, subsoils underneath mm -hmm. sod, um, but I do know that whenever we are reviewing permits and what have you, it has to be stamped and approved by a, a certified arborist, forester, or landscape architect. So they, whenever they're looking at those plans and they're designing them as well, they have to be uh, installed accordingly. So we do rely on third party services a lot when related to that, relying on those professionals accordingly. From a, um, from a tree replacement perspective, um, whenever we're reviewing um, a subdivision or a site development permit for a restaurant or what have you, and they're considering looking at existing trees on sites, we, it, existing trees fall into three uh, sp three general categories um, or tiers, if you will. Trees that are 12 inches or smaller um, do not require uh, any specific approval from the city to be removed. Trees that are between 12 and 25 
inches in diameter require um, the, set, the planning department before removal. We have that to receive permission from us. And then trees 25 inches or larger are considered specimen trees and they require approval by the Planning and Zoning Commission before they can remove them. Now, the middle tier, the 12 to 25, typically requires if you are gonna remove it um, and you, re you receive approval from us to do so, you typically have to replace it at a one and a half to one ratio per caliper inch loss. That's the diameter of the tree. Uh, trees that are 25 and above are two to one ratio, and uh, the going rate right now is $150 per caliper inch. So within that ordinance, whenever a developer wants to um, remove a tree, we do everything we possibly can to have them work around that tree. Sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes, like the example for the subdivision out on Opal, Opal Lane, the concept layout was entitled in a development agreement, so they had the right to remove it even though our current uh, landscape ordinance otherwise wouldn't allow them to do so. So where we can, we work as best as we possibly can with the developer to m fully mitigate those. Um, for example, when they remove those trees, even though they are allowed to have that concept layout, the street layout, they replace as many trees on site from a one and a half or a two to one ratio as they could. In addition to all, both the two trees they had to have for every single residential lot, and where those areas that they couldn't, when they literally ran out of room to not overcrowd the trees, they paid the value of the $150 per caliper inch to the parks department. Uh, we coordinate with them as well. Uh, we always ask them, hey, are you looking for trees, depending on the time of year, if the developer is wanting to remove trees or we're, or we're considering removing some of them or allowing them to happen, we coordinate with them appropriately. So sometimes they want the money because they can hold on to it and then plant trees at a later time in the year where it's more effective, but sometimes it's more effective to have the trees at that time. So that, that's it in a nutshell. Okay. So each project's unique. Um, we don't want them to do moonscaping. We don't want them to necessarily tear down trees. We just have fun well, with it. No, not at all. And there are some exceptions to certain species like juniper ash, mesquite, uh, those trees that we don't want to see necessarily. Um, that are that are short-lived, or they, they're they're signs of desert desertification, if you will. Are, are um, we are we are we implementing enough buffer barriers in the basins to, like, allow the runoff to slow down around these developments? Because obviously, we don't want fast volume water flowing into our waste systems. Do we have? Are our developments in mind looking at slowing down this runoff water? Um, yeah. Yes, they have to by state law. Uh, they have to be engineered appropriately to do that as part of the detention systems. So we require it, and I'm not a civil engineer, and he <laughs> went home already, I think. But uh, in a nutshell, uh, we, we've adopted what's called Atlas 14 regulations, and it's post-Harvey rainfall totals in a 24-hour period. So it's actually more robust than it used to be prior to that. So the uh, development has to, any development has to account for that with a larger basin for detention or some um, similar yet as effective way of handling that stormwater. Do we have any tree boxes in our, in our city, in a sidewalk, a tree that's living off the water that runs into the drain? That, like in the city of Austin, they have some of those. That's how they have, that's how they that's well, how they thrive and live in downtown. I think it sounds I, like y'all, the two of y'all need to have like a longer discussion yeah, about it. Yeah, this is deep. We can this is very have complex. This is, there are 30 deep. people yes. in the room, so we just gotta yeah. gotta find a way to. Okay. Yeah. So the email of the landscaping ordinance, and then a meeting yep. to get more mm -hmm. familiarized, and then a, any proposal you want to bring back mm -hmm. to amend the landscaping ordinance, or like you say, if you're if it's a budgetary item, we can bring that up in the yeah. okay. workshop. Yeah, I'd yeah. be happy to have a meeting with you okay. for sure. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. All right, next up, agenda item 34, discussion of possible action regarding offices to be located at the Public Safety Center, including but not limited to staff, administration, council. Councilmember floor scale. All right, thank you. Yay, we're almost done. Um, and I want to preface this with this is not, um, I'm not bringing this agenda item up for any other reason other than to bring clarity to the situation. Um, so I took a tour of the Public Safety Center um, and um, there were some things that I didn't quite agree with. I also mm -hmm. want to state 
I am 100% on board with staff going into the Public Safety Center. That does support the police department, and that makes sense. Um, staff that does not take away from the downtown uh, footage, meaning um, I, I would not like to see economic development over there or, um, or any other staff that um, I think brings some kind of uh, walkability or people to the downtown. So, um, so as I was taking this tour, I, I noticed that there were what, what was referenced to as attorney's offices, council member offices, city manager offices, and a mayor's office. Um, and when you talk about the administrative part of our government, that is what I would consider, and in fact what the dictionary considers, um, City Hall, it makes me a little uncomfortable for a lot of reasons. Um, and I'm not going to talk about it all, but I will say I have several concerns regarding parking, regarding um, foot traffic being allocated somewhere else. Um, I guess a, a line of like, of like, that's a public safety center. And in my eyes, that belongs to the chief of police. Um, and so I think it can kind of get convoluted when we add a city manager. Um, and let me say, we don't have a permanent city manager at this point. And so I don't even know if they'd want to be in the public safety center. Um, and then on top of that, you have city council. And I think that makes for a really distorted view of who that building is, is run by. And so... Um, my idea of staff that belongs in um, the public safety center would be uh, the communica communication department and IT. Um, I, s I just did a list of departments that have their own buildings, and it looks like there's, after all that, after communication and IT and all the uh, departments that already have their own locations. It looks like we have building, engineering, finance, HR, planning, utility billing, economic development, and then, of course, you know, the city manager. Um, and so I wanted to bring it out so at least we can give direction to um, ACGM on how that area is supposed to look um, and who's going to go over there. There, at one point, I learned that there is like a Google type setup. Meaning, um, it's like a like a, a kindergarten class where kids can like or kids people can sit across. It for me, it's not best use of space. Um, and again, I I didn't get a good grasp of this until I took my tour. And then um, I've had issues in the past regarding uh, who I think should go over there. The limited information I received and just a general consensus of what I think council needs to decide. And so um, for now, I would just like to sit back and listen to what the council has to say regarding who they would like to see in that building. Because um, ultimately at the end of the day, it is the will of council. My hope is that we keep city hall and all its support within city hall. Um, and, and that we can find a way to allow staff to go over there um, as not to take up, uh, I say take up, but because um, I, I know the police department, we have officers who do interviews um, that are three officers to a, a, a cubicle in a room. And so um, I'd like to see a little bit better for, you know, for our officers as we start them out in the new public safety center. So I am open to conversation. Customer Hodger. Um, so this is something that I've been having conversations about for a while now. Um, and to my understanding, there is not an immediate need for changing up the floor plan or who is assigned where when it comes to city staff or council. Uh, so to me, this seems like uh, a conversation around something that is not broken and therefore uh, I, I don't see an immediate need for us to try to make changes to something that was approved by the voters uh, in terms of the the usage of the public safety center so 
that's not to say that if the time comes that PD needs more space, that we can't open the conversation. But for, for now, uh, I, I, it seems to me that, uh, you know, as uh, Assistant uh, Chief Hernandez said via Mayor Mitchell, is uh, if there's not a problem, don't make one. And it doesn't seem like there's a problem that needs to be fixed right now. So uh, that would just be my two cents on the matter. Additional comments, Mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> two words. City manager. City manager. We need to hire a city manager. When we hire a city manager, that person, he or she, will make the ultimate decision in the end of where his or her staff needs to go. This has been going on since I've been on council for almost three years now, just like Prop F, when that's at a stalemate right now. I hear the concerns that people were saying this was just supposed to be for the police officers and city staff and so forth. The bond language, the bond language. Who deserves an office? Who deserves the curtains? Who deserves the carpet? That stuff. There's a lot of people out there that are supporting to move city staff over there. There are also people over there saying, nope, you guys are deceived us at the voter box because now you're moving City Hall over there. Many years ago, I'll say this, many years ago I heard a rumor that there was an idea that Uptown Kyle, that City Hall will eventually end up over there. West of Kyle, by the fancy golf course, by the nice restaurants, everything is going to be moved that side. Here, I actually heard one person said, of course, because downtown looks ugly. That was very, very disrespectful. That really broke my heart when they said that. It wasn't a city staff member, it was actually a resident. But in a nutshell, as Mr. Heiser had said, there's a lot of precedenting things going forward. My main objective is number one, let's get a city manager on board Number two, let's get that building finished. These officers need to get in there. It's way past due. So when the time comes when we have a city manager on post, when we have a city manager hired, let them be able to design and see where their city staff needs to be. And we can go from there. I know a lot of us here on council want to have a sense of a control of like, no, this is, mayor doesn't deserve an office or councilman doesn't deserve an office, whatever the case is. But right now, my main focus on this is let's get the building finished and let's focus on getting city manager. Once the city manager is there, is hired, that person can then look at his team subjectively and say, this is where I feel my people need to be. For all you know, he may say, you know what, we ain't going anywhere, we're staying right here. And all these years of discussion just went out the door. But on my feeling on this, I know there's a lot of residents that feel that, okay, if you guys move over there, you decepted the voters, and some people say we need the space. I have came here, I have, I don't come to City Hall very often. But I did see somebody sitting on the floor with a computer. So that tells me either they're running out of space up there or there's just no room or whatever the case may be. But I think going forward on this, let us get a city manager on board. Let us move forward in that direction. And when it comes time to where the building is open up, we respectfully allow that person to make that administrative decision. Additional comments, Councilmember Parsley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
So yeah, this discussion has been going on for a while, and I second everything that Count, uh, Mayor Pretem Tobias just mentioned. I think that allowing for our new city manager to come and make those administrative decisions would probably be the best way to go about it. Um, what I what I do believe, and and those are just my own comments. Um, I do believe that there should be a, a share office that maybe council members can use. Um, I'm not saying that it has to be on the public safety center, it can be here, because I believe this is where we hold our regular council meetings and, and it should be here in City Hall, um, as well as it should be, in my opinion, the city manager's office. Um, if there is a flex room and the public safety center for us to meet, completely makes sense. Um, I also asked Chief to please provide me with a list of potential uses that he could um, see that he had a need for if he had additional space. Um, I also asked Jerry to please let me know how many staff members we currently have working from home that are in need of offices. So there is a need for staff to have additional offices and I believe that just balancing that and it needs to be something that hopefully our city manager would do. Um, it will be, I don't think the smartest thing to do to start appointing offices to anyone and then when we have the new hire city manager, he will wanna rearrange that. So I do think it's important for us to know the needs instead of the wants. If Chief Barnett believes that there is additional space that needs to be used in the public safety center, so let's take a look and let's evaluate. And that's something, a decision, a, a decision that we should be taking with, or the city manager should be taking on. Same for the staff offices um, that we should be getting for the new staff members that we have coming up and the ones that are working from home because of lack of space. So those are my thoughts. Any other comments? Well, I can memorialize it in a, what I'm hearing in a motion, if y'all wanted, so that we could be definitive, which I think we need to be, because we've discussed it a lot. So the, uh, I'd like to make a motion to direct the interim city manager to continue moving forward with the development of the uh, offices as the interim city manager sees fit until such a time as the official city manager can come in and make those decisions. Second. All right, motion by the mayor, seconded by Council Member Zuniga. Is there discussion on the motion? All those in favor yes, say aye. I have discussion, <clears throat> discussion too. Okay. Council Member Florsko. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I have a couple of uh, responses I want to say. One, um, to the whole idea, if there's not a problem, let's not create one. Uh, I think that's a misuse of words, and I find that highly unfair. Um, I don't know the background and how much you know regarding the bond or the history of it, or the history of what indeed was supposed to be uh, City Kyle Hall moved to Plum Creek as written in a uh, news article in 2019 regarding uh, not wanting to spend more than $4 million uh, on the police department, which now went up to $37 million. So I, I do uh, have a little bit of, uh, I don't know what to call it, I'm paranoid, I guess. Uh, because the, the truth of the matter is there is a long history and I'm not sure how much research was done in order to figure out that history or to figure out if there really is a problem. My concern stems with taking a vote that will move City Hall to the Public Safety Center. That bothers me. At the end of the day, that's, that's what I'm concerned with. I understand people want to wait for a city manager. With that said, our city manager will not tell council where we'll be only council could tell us where we're gonna be. That concerns me. I think if we would like more room, we take the $10 million from 104 South Burleson and we put a garage right over there and we make a walkway right. and we make it bigger that way. I'm giving you solutions is all no, I'm saying. I, I, just r please wrap it up. I don't wanna call a question, but that you're, we're, it's late and you're spinning out. We've, we've said I, our piece. I, late, you took 35 minutes to give a presentation and this is my right, agenda I'm gonna item. I'm call the question. So uh, yes vote ends debate and we move on. A no vote uh, allows debate to continue. Is 
Zuniga? Uh, no. Bradshaw? Yes. Heiser? Yes. Tobias? Nay. Parsley? Nay. Flores Kill? Nay. Mitchell? All right. Yes, motion fails. Uh, three to four. Councilmember Flores Kill. This is not supposed to, I, I preface this, this is not supposed to be an argument. That's not what I wanted. What I want is for us to collectively, as a council, agree that maybe our city, our city management doesn't belong over there. And if you guys are even want to wait until we get a new city manager, that's fine. But that does not negate the fact that we, as a council, have to decide if we want to go over or not. So even if you direct Jerry to say keep going forward with, I don't know who knows what the back, what the information is. I didn't quite understand it until I took the tour. So if you direct him to do that, even that doesn't give full direction because we don't all understand or know what the setup of the building was supposed to be. All I'm asking for is just to work together. Let's put staff over there. Yes. Do we have an overflow? Yes, we do. Do we need, do we need to be over there collectively as a council? I do not feel like that at all. I do not feel like Jerry needs to be over there. I do not feel like Jennifer needs to be over there. I don't think we do. That is our administrative government, and it belongs here in City Hall. May I make a comment? So uh, I think Councilman Zuniga was next, oh, if he wanted to make his comments. Uh, yeah, so my little two cents. So about quorum, if we're all together, um, also um, how that's gonna work. And um, this is not a full-time position. So I'm, I have reservations of how much I need the space. I'll, yes, there are times I need, I need personal space to look at my papers and laptop and stuff. But I just wanna remind everybody and the taxpayers, this is not, we're not doing this because we want to move into a full-time position. That's all I have to say about that. Well, I, I would just say they're flex offices, and so I do think that there, we could have a conversation about moving some of the council offices back. Uh, it's, oh, okay. it's not about having or moving some of the council offices to City Hall. It's, it's about trying to legislate that here in this highly politicized environment. There are ways for us to handle this where it's not so uh, polarizing. And while we all have different opinions about who needs to go where, but ultimately, as far as the management of the resources, that, that question does belong at, at the city manager level. We, that is very micromanaging. Now, as far as council offices, I agree that, that the, the city manager is not gonna make those, dis, those, uh, those moves, most likely. That'll be something that we would need to make. But just generally speaking, as it relates to which departments work best with which that is absolutely under the purview of the city manager. And, and we all have our opinions about what constitutes city hall. We've, we've discussed this for years. You've brought this up multiple times on the record and made these statements multiple times on the record. And I, 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 I feel like you think that I'm the one who set all this stuff up, and I'm not. I'm not the one who set it all up. I, I made the deal on one part and that was the 44,000 and 20,000. The rest was done through a task force, through a long conversation with the city management and staff at that time. Uh, it was robust, not everyone <laughs> agreed with it, but that's what happened. You weren't on the council when all of those discussions took place. And so it is, we can change it up if we want and say that this new council here, you know, we're four years into this at the literal 99 percentile of the, in terms of the total evolution, we're just gonna change up who goes where. Uh, we can do that, but it just, I think that those kind of decisions belong with the incoming city manager and whose name goes on a door is very easy to change moving forward. It's not a done, done deal. There aren't, we don't even have city attorneys uh, at this point in time. And there are many, many offices on the PD side that are not yet filled either. And so they have more space than they know what to do with with 44,000 square feet. We have more space than we know what to do with with 20,000 square feet. It's a good problem to have. For the first time, both the administrative side and the police side will be uh, will not be at overcapacity. We have been at overcapacity since the day I took office. It's a wonderful thing, a great solution to a big problem in the community. So I'm just 
I'm just asking for us to just let it proceed forward as it has been planned for a very long time, knowing that those offices can be changed. It's a trial and error. There's an annex position now. So it's, there's an initial sort of outlay and then, and then there can be uh, changes down the road. So I, I'm, I, I don't wanna continue to have this debate if we can avoid it. Councilmember Parsley. I just feel like we, we definitely need to have a conversation of you know certain offices, like maybe not council or mayor offices or the city attorney's offices um, that may not be completely necessary, but if there is a staff member that is going to be needing those offices, then I guess we will be removing the labels of council, mayor, city manager, city attorneys, and then we need to balance and maybe have a, a workshop day or a morning where we come together with chief and he can show us what he needs and we can see from the side of staff what they need and then decide who is going to go where. That's when well, I feel that. Like it's a situation like, so what are you going to say as opposed to economic development, we're going to send finance, engineering, yeah. planning? Are Some, those more related? So it's, it's a situation of trying to, it, trying to group things together, but it's just I'm, I'm trying to get us to stay out of it as much as possible, at least at this point in time when it's so highly politicized. Everything is being politicized in terms of every decision that we are making. And I, I, I don't care on a lot of these things. It, it just, but the... the Customer Heiser. Uh, just so I fully understand, let's hypothetical here. We reappropriate the current construct of this floor plan in terms of, let's say, council not moving, not having space in the public safety center, or economic development not moving. What in your vision happens to that space that on this on this floor plan here is currently designed? What and and just I'll add on to that. What happens to that space that doesn't require us to spend more money on trying to uh, accommodate any sort of changes, structural changes that PD would need in order to utilize that space? Because it sounds to me like going down this pathway is only gonna open the door for us to be spending more money on the public safety center right now before it's even opened. So A, the rooms were never we never took a vote on who would be going over there. Let's make that clear. All that was decided without council input. Two, if you're talking about spending more money, I think it's silly to get everybody over there and then get a city manager and then he decides he doesn't want to be over there and we bring it back. So if you're worried about spending more money, that's another place where we could save money is to say, okay, we will have support staff there. What do I consider support staff? Anybody that's not administrative as far as managing the city so i would say jerry and jennifer need to stay in this building we could put everybody else over there i'm okay with that i'm not saying no to that what i'm saying is i don't want to see our city hall staff and when i say city hall i mean people who run the city assistant city manager um city manager city secretary attorney they can all stay and house over here. Let's be clear, guys. We have conference room. If we need to go in there and, and utilize it, we can. I think this is the most poorly designed uh, upstairs I've seen in my whole life. There's a lot of wasted space. We could do something in here to make this city hall bigger. We have money. We just don't have it allocated to that. If our goal is to make more room, then let's make more room. What I'm saying is let's not go over there, overfill that, and then have no plan B, unless, unless you have a plan that I don't know of, to get staff out of there. I mean, I, I think this is a bigger conversation is what does the future of this building look like, at least for me, when we look at downtown development. And if I, I don't even want to go down this road, I'm happy to, to, we can table this for another time, but this is, it's not going to be productive at this point. I just, I just think that given there isn't an immediate need for this additional space that is being appropriated per this document or per uh, the types of I'm wondering where that information came from. I, that information was not given to me. So I, that, that's, that's another issue, I think, is the disparity in information that we were given. Because, no, I did not know that if all of a sudden 
the police won't have any usage for the other side. Now, I will say it's going to be difficult because that side was made with no security that that is needed for that our is my point, police. Is that if we are to make changes to the current floor plan or to the this the forty thousand square feet that is. If we're to add to that, it is going to require further investment from a city perspective to accommodate the security needs of the city. And that's coming from Chief Barnett. Right. And it will anyways because that is a public safety but center that's eventually not we have to down do the right line. Now. All right. We, we, we've comment. got last comment. All right. Chief, have the doors already been ordered for all of the uh, offices? Because uh, I would like to see that there's glass in those doors uh, so that and the doors remain open just because more more visibility who's in who's in what rooms uh, yeah jeff barnett chief of police for the record to answer your question have the doors been ordered for the facility yes do they have any glass i don't yeah. think I, they're, all, they're, well, all, they're all solid closed I, I think for the most part they're solid doors so i don't think they have any glass in them correct okay if There's I may add to that, is because they got to have fire doors for the safety of it all. Well, you, you will have evidence. You'll have. I mean, I mean, it's a big building. I mean, and when all the doors are closed, you don't know who's in that, who's in what rooms. So, I like to walk down the hallway. This person's here. This person's not here today. That's kind of why, sir. It's an authorized area, personnel only. Right. So there's a motion. Can can we? Can you restate it so we can take a vote? Uh, the motion is to direct the uh, interim city manager to continue uh, with oversight over the floor plan, uh, uh, as well as the new city manager when they come into office. Second. It's, uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Hi, sir. Sorry, can we restate this roll call vote one more time, please? Keep things where they are. Keep things the oh, way they yes, are. Yes, I want to keep things. Yes, keep it. Yes. Mitchell? Yes. Parsley? Nay. Zunica? Yes. Flores Kale? Nay. Bradshaw? Yes. Tobias? Aye. All right, motion carries five to two. Motion to adjourn. Second. We are adjourned. Thank you.